Chapter 116. Harden. Tess's professor smiles, checking her out fairly subtly as he does so. But I see it clearly. Nice to see you again, he says, but I can't tell if he's talking to me or Tessa, really, the way he moves about to the music. Professor Soto lives in Seattle now, Tessa informs me. Convenient, I say under my breath. Tessa hears me and gently nudges me with her elbow, and I wrap my arm around her waist. Jonah's eyes briefly note where I've placed my arm, then move back up to her face. She's taken, Dick. Yeah, I transferred to the Seattle campus a couple weeks ago. I applied for a job a few months back and finally got it. My band was ready for a move anyway, he tells us with an attitude that indicates he thinks we should care about any of this. The Reckless View will be playing here tonight and every other night, if we can talk him into it, Christian boasts. Jonas smiles and looks down at his boots. I think that might be possible, he says, looking back up with a smile. Finishing his drink in one motion, he says, well, we better get ready to play. Yeah. Don't let us keep you. Christian pats Soto on the back, and the professor turns to give Tessa one last smile, before pushing through the small crowd toward the stage. The band is incredible. Wait until you hear them. Vance claps his hands together once, before he wraps his arms around Kimberly and leads her to a table in front of the stage. I've already heard them. They are not incredible. Tessa turns to me with nervous eyes. He's nice. Remember, he gave you a character witness when you were about to be expelled. No, I don't recall anything about him, actually. Except for the fact that he seems to like you and is mysteriously living in Seattle now teaching at your fucking campus. You heard him say that he applied there months ago, and he does not like me. He does. You think everyone likes me, she fires back. She can't possibly be naive enough to assume that this guy has good intentions. Shall we make a list, then? There's Ed, fucking Trevor, that dickhead of a waiter who am I missing? Oh, and now we can add your creepy professor, who was just eyeing you like you were dessert. I look to where that dick is on the little bandstand, walking about with an attitude that's both self-important and fake casual. Zed is the only person on that list that counts. Trevor is very sweet, and he never meant any harm. I'll probably never see Robert again, and Soto is not a stalker. One word in that spiel doesn't sit well with me. Probably? I obviously won't see him again. You the one I'm with, okay? She pushes one of her hands into mine, and I relax. I need to make sure I burned or flush that damn waiter's phone number, just in case. I still think this asshole is a stalker. I nod toward the stage of the douch bag in his leather jacket. I may need to talk to my father just to make sure he isn't as shady as I think he is. Tessa would approach a lion with fucking kid gloves, she's no good at judging character. She proves my point when she beams up at me, smiling like an idiot because of the champagne running through her veins. She's actually here with me after all the shit I've put her through I thought this was a jazz club, but his band is more, Tessa begins to try and take my mind off the seemingly endless list of men who want her affection. Should he? I interrupt her. She swats my arm. No, just not jazz music. They are more like the fray, sort of. The fray? Don't go insulting your favorite band, now. The only thing I remember about the professor's band is that they fucking suck. She bumps her shoulder against my arm. And yours. Not quite. Don't act like you don't like them. I know you do. She squeezes my hand, and I shake my head, not denying it, really, but I'm not going to admit it either. I stare back and forth between the wall and Tess's tits, while waiting for the godforsaken band to set up. Can we just go now? I ask. One song. Tessa's cheeks are flushed, and her eyes are wide and glossy. She takes another drink. Her hands run over her dress, tugging it down and up at once. Can I at least sit down? I nod toward line of empty stools at the bar. I take Tessa's hand in my own and pull her to the bar. I sit on the last stool, closest to the wall and farthest from the crowd. What are you having, a young man with a goatee and a fake-ass Italian accent asks us. A glass of champagne and a water, I say as Tessa moves to stand between my legs. 
I rest one hand on the small of her back, the beads of her dress rough against my palm. We only sell champagne by the bottle, sir. The bartender gives me an apologetic smile, as if he's sure I couldn't afford a bottle of his fucking champagne. A bottle will be fine. Vance's voice sounds next to me, and the bartender nods, looking back and forth between the two of us. She'll have it chilled, I cockily remark. The kid nods again, and scurries away to fetch the bottle. Dick. Stop babysitting us, I tell Vance. Tessa scowls at me, but I ignore her. He rolls his eyes like the sarcastic Twitty is. I'm clearly not babysitting you. She's underage. Yeah, yeah, I say. Someone calls his name, and he pats my shoulder before walking off. A few moments later, the bartender pops a bottle of champagne open and pours the bubbling liquid into a glass for Tessa. She politely thanks him, and he responds with a smile even more artificial than his accent. His little pantomime of cool is killing me. She brings the glass to her lips and rests her back against my chest. It's so good. Just then, two men walk by and give her a quick glance. She notices, I know she does, because she leans further into me and lays her head against my shoulder. There's Sasha, she says over the sound of Professor Stalker's guitar being tested on the sound equipment. The tall blonde is searching the room, either for her boyfriend or a random dude to nail. Who cares? I gently grip her elbow and turn her to face me. I don't like her, she quietly states. No one does. You don't, she asks. Is she insane? Why would I? I don't know. Her eyes move to my mouth. Because she's pretty. So? I don't know I'm just being weird. She shakes her head in an attempt to get rid of the resentment that is clear on her face. Are you jealous, Teresa? No. She pouts. You shouldn't be. I open my legs further and pull her against me again. That's not what I want. I move my eyes to her nearly exposed chest. You are. I trace the line of her cleavage with my index finger, as if we aren't in a crowded club. Only for my boobs. She whispers the last word. Obviously. I chuckle, teasing her. I knew it. Tessa pretends to be offended, but smiles over the rim of her glass. Yeah, well, now that the truth is out, you can let me fuck them, I say, much too loud. Champagne spurts out of her mouth and onto my shirt and lap. Sorry, she squeals, reaching for the napkin bin on the bar. She dabs the napkin across this fucking horrendous monstrosity of a shirt and then moves to wipe at my crotch. I grab her wrist and take the napkin from her. I wouldn't do that. Oh. Her flush spreads down her neckline. One of the band members makes their introduction into the microphone, and I try my best not to heave when the eardrum assault begins. Tessa watches intently as they're all from one song to another, and I continue to keep her glass full. I'm thankful for the way we're sitting. Well, the way I'm sitting. She's standing between my legs, her back toward me, but I can see her face when I slightly lean back against the bar behind me. The low red lighting in the place, the champagne, and her being her, makes her glow. It's impossible not to watch her smile and stare at the stage. I can't even be jealous, because she's just that beautiful. As if she can read my mind, she turns around and gives me an eager smile. I love seeing her this way, so carefree so young. I need to make her feel this way more often. They are good, right? She nods along to the slow yet edgy sound. I shrug. No. They aren't terrible but they sure as hell aren't good. Sure. She exaggerates the word and turns back around. Moments later, her hips begin to sway along to the whining voice of the lead singer. Fuck. I move my hand down to the curve of her hip, and she backs into me, still moving. The tempo of the song speeds up, and Tessa does the same. Holy fuck. We've done a lot of shit I've done a lot of shit, but I've never had anyone dance on me this way. I've had girls and even a few strippers give me a lap dance, but not like this. This is slow, intoxicating and achingly fucking hot. My other hand moves to her other hip, and she turns slightly to place her glass on the bar top. With her hands empty, she gives me a salacious smile, and looks back to the stage. She lifts up one hand and runs her small fingers through my hair, and places the other hand on top of mine. 
Keep going, I beg. You sure? She tugs at the roots of my hair. It's hard to believe that this seductive girl, wearing a short, black dress, swaying her hips, and tugging my hair, is the same girl who spits her champagne when I talk about fucking her chest. She's such a turn on. Yes, fuck, I breathe and lift a hand up to the nape of her neck, bringing her ear to my mouth. Move against me, I squeeze her hip. Closer. She does just that. I'm thankful for my height as I sit on the bar stool, the perfect height for her ass to move against me, hitting the exact spot that aches for her. I pull my attention from her, only for a second, to scan our surroundings. I don't want anyone else watching her dance. You're so sexy right now, I say against the shell of her ear. Dancing this way, in public for me and only me. I swear I hear her moan through the music, and that's all I can take. I turn her around and push my hand under her skirt. Harden. She groans when I slide her panties to the side. No one is paying any attention. Even if they were, they can't see, I assure her. I wouldn't be doing this if I thought anyone could possibly witness it. Do you like putting on that show, didn't you? I say. She can't deny it, she's soaking. She doesn't respond. She only rests her head on my shoulder and pulls at the bottom of my shirt, fisting it in her hand like she normally would do our sheets. I pump in and out of her, trying to match the haunting melody of the song. Almost instantly, her legs are stiffening and she's coming on my fingers. She hums, letting me know just how much pleasure I'm bringing her. She leans in further, her mouth sucking at the base of my neck. Her hips rock into me, keeping a steady beat with my fingers pumping in and out of her wet pussy. Her moans are drowned out by the music and the voices around us, and her nails could possibly be breaking the skin on my stomach. I'm going to, she groans into my neck. I know, baby. Come for me. Right here, Tessa. Come. I gently persuade her. She nods, biting down on the tendon in my neck, and I feel my cock pulsing, pressing against the front of my jeans. All of her weight rests on me as she orgasms, and I hold her up. She's panting, absolutely flushing, glowing under the lights, when she lifts her head. Car or bathroom, she asks when I bring my fingers to my lips, sucking her sweetness from them. Car, I reply hastily, and she downs the last of her champagne. Vance can pay for that shit. I don't have time to hunt down the bartender. Tessa takes my hand and drags me toward the door. She's eager, and I'm hard as fuck from her seduction game at the bar. Is that Tessa stops in her tracks near the front of the club? Black hair, styled to stick up wildly, peeks through the crowd. I would have sworn my paranoia was causing me to hallucinate if she hadn't seen him too. Why the fuck is he here? Did you tell him you were coming to the club? I hiss. I've kept my cool all night, only to have it sabotaged by this asshole. No. Of course not. Tessa exclaims, defending herself. I can tell by her white eyes that she's being honest. Zed spots us, and a mischievous frown takes over his face. Being the fucking instigator that he is, he walks over to where we're standing. What are you doing here? I ask him as he approaches. Same thing as you. He rolls his shoulders and looks at Tessa. I fight the urge to pull the top of her dress up and knock his teeth out. How did you know she was here? I ask him. Tessa tugs at my arm and looks back and forth between Zed and me. I didn't. I'm here to watch the band. A man with the same tan skin as Zed joins us. You should go, I tell the two of them. Harden please, Tessa whines behind me. Don't, I whisper to her. I've had enough of Zed and his shit. Hey the man moves to stand between us. They're doing another set. Let's go tell them we're here. Do you know Soto? Tessa asks. Damn it, Tessa. Yeah, we do, the stranger says. I can practically see the conspiracy theories floating through her mind about how these people know each other, but just wanting to be away from Zed, I take her by the arm and guide us to the door. See you around, Zed says giving Tessa his best I'm a lost fucking puppy, and I want you to feel bad for me, and love me, because I'm a pathetic fuck smile, before following the other guy toward the stage. I rush out the door, and into the cold air. Tessa follows closely behind, insisting, 
I didn't know he was coming here. I swear. I unlock the car and open the passenger door for her. I know, I know, I say to silence her. I'm trying my best to talk myself down from going back inside. Drop it. Please. I don't want to ruin the night. I walk around to the other side of the car and slide in next to her. Okay, she agrees, nodding. Thank you. I sigh. I slip a key into the ignition, and Tessa puts her hand on my cheek to turn my head toward her. I really appreciate you making such an effort tonight. I know it's hard for you, but it means the world to me. As she utters her words of praise, I smile against her palm. Okay. I mean it. I love you, Harden. So much. I tell her how much I love her, while she climbs across the console and straddles my lap. Her hands are quick to undo my jeans and tug them down just enough her mouth is quick against my neck, and she pulls at my shirt popping the top two buttons off in a rushed attempt to gain access to my chest. I push her dress up to expose her tight little body to me, and she digs into my back pocket to retrieve the condom that I suspected I would need. I only want you, always, she reassures me, calming my racing mind as she slides the condom onto me. I grip her hips and help lift her body. In the small space of the car it feels closer, deeper, as she lowers herself onto me. As I feel her, completely and possessively, a low hiss escapes my mouth. She covers my lips, swallowing my moans as she moves her hips slowly, the way she did in the club. It's so fucking deep this way, I say, taking her bun in my hand, and tugging gently to force her to look at me. So good, she groans, taking me inside her, feeling every inch of me. One of her hands moves to my hair, while the other rests at the base of my throat. She's so fucking sexy this way, when alcohol is laced with adrenaline, and she's full of hunger and need, need for me, for my body, for this raw passionate connection, that only we share. She couldn't find this with anyone else, and neither could I I have everything I need here with her, and she can't ever leave me. Fuck, I love you, I breathe into her mouth as she tugs at my hair, and her fingers tighten on my neck. It's not uncomfortable, it's fairly light pressure, but it's driving me fucking insane. I love you, she gasps when I lift my hips to meet her, thrusting harder than before. I stare at her, and revel in the sensation of her flexing her hips. The slow building of pleasure begins at the base of my spine, and I can feel Tessa tensing as I continue to aid her, by lifting my hips with each thrust. She has got to get on the pill. I need to feel her skin to skin again. I can't wait to be inside you without a condom I say into her neck. Keep going, she urges me. She loves my dirty mouth. I want you to feel me come inside you, I suck at the salty skin of her collarbone, tasting the thin layer of sweat there. You'll fucking love it, won't you? Me marking you that way? The thought alone pushes me over the edge. I'm almost she moans, and with one harsh tug at my hair, we ride out our highs together, panting, and moaning, and messy, and us. I help her off of my lap and roll down the window while she adjusts her dress. What are you? She begins, and I toss the condom out the window. You did not just throw a dirty condom out of the window. What if Christian sees it? I smile evilly at her. I'm sure it won't be the only condom he finds in this lot. Her hands fumble with my zipper, helping me dress again, so I can drive. Maybe not. She scrunches her nose and looks out the window as I put the car into gear. It smells like sex in here, she adds and bursts into laughter. I nod and listen to her hum along to every single fucking song on the radio as we drive back to Vance's place. I almost tease her for it, but it's actually sort of a lovely sound, especially after listening to that shitty shitty band play. Lovely sound? I'm even starting to talk like her. I'm going to have to physically remove my eardrums after tonight, I remark as she carries on. She sticks her tongue out at me like a child, and sings even louder. I take Tessa's hand in mine to steady her as we walk up to the driveway en route to the front door. The way she's acting, I'm guessing most of that champagne finally hit her liver. What if we were locked out, she asks with a giggle, when we reach the driveway. The babysitter is here, I remind her. Oh yeah. Lillian she smiles. She's so nice. I grin at the level of her intoxication. I thought you didn't like her. I do, 
Now that I know she doesn't like you the way you led me to believe she did. I touch her lips. Don't pout. She's a lot like you only more annoying. Excuse me? She hiccups. That wasn't very nice of you to make me jealous of her. It worked, didn't it? I reply smugly as we reach the door. Lillian is seated alone on the couch when we enter the house. I take a moment to pull the front of Tess's dress up a little. She rolls her eyes at me. Seeing us, Lillian stands to her feet. How was it? It was so, so much fun. The band was great. Tessa beams. She's wasted, I inform Lillian. She laughs. I can see that. After a pause, she says, Smith is asleep. He almost had a conversation with me tonight. Good for you, I say and lead Tessa toward the hall. My drunk girlfriend waves at Lillian. It was nice seeing you. I don't know if I should tell Lillian to leave now or wait until Vance shows up so I don't say anything. Besides, let her deal with that little robot kid if he wakes up. When we get to Tessa's room, I close the door behind us and she immediately plops onto the bed. Can you take this off? She points to her dress. It's so itchy. Yeah, stand up. I help her out of her dress and she thanks me with a kiss on the tip of my nose. It's a simple gesture, but it catches me off guard, and I smile at her. I'm so glad you're here with me, she says. Are you? She nods and undoes the remainder of the buttons left on Christian's shirt. Her hands push the garment down my arms, and she folds it neatly, before walking to the hamper. I'll never understand why she folds dirty clothes, but I'm used to it by now. Yes, very. Seattle isn't as great as I thought, she finally admits. Then come back with me, I want to say. Why not? I say instead. I don't know. It's just not. She frowns, and I'm surprised that instead of wanting to hear how miserable she is here, I want to change the subject. Landon and I both suspected she felt this way, but still it makes me feel bad that it's not exactly what she'd wanted. I should take her out tomorrow during the day to cheer her up. You could move to England, I say. She glares at me with red cheeks and champagne-glazed eyes. You won't take me there for a wedding, but you want me to move there, she says, calling me out. We'll talk about it later, I say, hoping she'll drop it right now. Yeah yeah always later. She walks back to sit on the bed but misses completely. Her body rolls onto the floor, and she bursts into a fit of laughter. Christ, Tessa. I grab hold of her hand and help her to her feet my heart pounding in my chest. I'm fine. She laughs and sits down on the bed, pulling me with her. I gave you too much champagne. Yep, you did. She smiles and pushes my shoulders back until I'm flat on the mattress. Are you okay? Do you feel sick? She rests her head against my chest. Stop parenting me, I'm fine. I bite my tongue instead of mouthing off to her. What do you want to do, she asks quietly. What? I'm bored. She looks up at me with that look. Tessa lifts herself up and stares down at me, eyes wild. What would you like to do, drunk ass? Pull your hair. She grins and pulls her bottom lip between her teeth in the most sinful way. Chapter 117. Harden. Can't sleep? Christian turns on the overhead light and joins me in the kitchen. Tessa needed some water, I tell him. I push the refrigerator door closed, but he stops it with his hand. Kim too. The price of drinking too much champagne, he says from behind me. Tessa's endless giggles and insatiable appetite for pleasure have worn me out. I'm convinced she'll be vomiting soon if she doesn't drink some water. Visions of her tonight, lying back on the bed, her legs spread for me as I brought her to orgasm using both my fingers and my tongue, flash through my mind. She was amazing as she always was when she rode my cock until I emptied myself into a condom. Yeah, Tess is a mess. I bite back a smile, while remembering her tumble off the bed. So England next weekend, then? He changes the subject. Nah, I'm not going. This is your mum's wedding we're talking about. And? It's not her first, probably won't be the last, I say. To say I'm completely shocked when his hand reaches out and knocks the bottled water from my hand, would be an understatement. What the fuck? 
I exclaim and bend down to grab the bottle. When I stand back up, Vance's eyes are focused on me, and the look in them is intense. You have no right to speak of your mum that way. What does it matter to you? I don't want to go, and I'm not going to. Give me a reason, a real one, he challenges me. What the fuck is his problem? I don't need to give anyone a reason. I just don't want to go to a stupid wedding. I've already been dragged to one this season, and that was enough for me. Fine. I've already sent in for Tessa's passport, so I assume you'll be fine without her, while she enjoys visiting England for the first time as Kim's companion? I drop the bottle to the floor. It can stay there this time. You what? I stare at him. He's fucking with me, he has to be. He leans against the island and crosses his arms. I sent in her application and paid for it the moment I found out about the wedding. She'll have to go downtown to finalize it and get her picture taken, but I've done the rest. I'm fuming. I can feel myself heating up. Why would you even do that? That's not even legal. Like I give a fuck if it's legal because I knew you'd be a stubborn asshole about the entire thing and I also knew that she was the only shot I had to get you to go. This is important to your mom and she's been worried that you won't go. She's right to be worried. You two think you can use Tessa to bully me into going to fucking England? Fuck both you and my mom. I open his refrigerator to grab another bottle of water just to be a dick, but he kicks it closed with his foot. Look, I knew you've had a shit life, okay? So did I, so I get it. But you won't be talking to me the way you talk to your parents. Then stop trying to meddle in my goddamn life the way they do. I'm not meddling. You know damn well that Tessa would love to go to that wedding, and you also know that you'll feel like an asshole if you deprive her of the opportunity for your own selfish reasons. You may as well get over being mad at me and thank me for making your week much easier. I stare at him for a few moments to take in what he is saying. He's half right, I've already started to feel bad for not wanting to go to the wedding. The only reason being that I know how much Tessa would love to go. She's already pouted about it enough tonight, and it's been wearing on my mind. I'll take your silence as a thank you. Ban smirks, and I roll my eyes. I don't want this to become a thing. What? The wedding? Yeah. How can I take her to another wedding and watch her eyes get all dull-like and watery? only to have to remind her that she won't ever have that. Christian's fingers tap against his chin. Ah, I see. His smile grows. That's what this is about, then. You don't want her getting any ideas? No. She already has the ideas. The woman's mind is full of ideas, that's the problem. Why would it be a problem? You don't want her to make an honest man out of you? Though he's taunting me, I'm glad to see that he isn't holding a grudge against me for my rude remarks only minutes ago. This is why I sort of like Vance, he's not as touchy as my father. Because it's not going to happen, and she's one of those crazy women who bring the shit up like a month after dating. She literally broke up with me, because I said I wouldn't marry her. She's batshit crazy sometimes. Vance chuckles and takes a sip of the water meant for his Kimberly. Tessa is waiting on me to bring her water too. I need to tie this conversation up. It's already been too long, too personal, for my liking. Consider yourself lucky that she wants that with you. You aren't exactly the easiest guy to be around. And if anyone knows that, it's her. I begin to ask him what the fuck he even knows about my relationship, but then I quickly remember that he's engaged to the biggest mouth in Seattle. Scratch that, the entire state of. Washington perhaps even the entire United States of, am I right? He interrupts my thoughts about his obnoxious woman. Yes, but still. It's ridiculous to think about marriage at all, especially when she's not even 20. This is coming from the man who doesn't want her more than three feet away from him at any given time? Asshole, I gripe. It's true. Doesn't mean you're not an asshole. Perhaps. I do find it amusing, though, that you don't intend on marrying her, but you can't seem to control your temper or anxiety when it comes to losing her. What's that supposed to mean? I don't think I want to know the answer to this question, but it's too late now. Vance's eyes meet mine. Your anxiety is at its highest when you're worried about her leaving you or when another man pays any attention to her. 
who says I have angsty, but the stubborn goat ignores me and continues on. You know what helps a hell of a lot when it comes to both of those things. What's that? A ring. He holds up his hand and touches the bare finger, where a wedding band will soon rest. Oh my fuck, she's gotten to you too. What did she do, pay you off? I laugh at the idea. It's not exactly too far-fetched, considering Tessa's obsession with marriage and her charm. No, you twat. He throws the cap of the water bottle at me. It's the truth. Imagine being able to say she's yours, and have it be true. Now it's only words, an empty boast to other men who will want her, and trust me, they will, but when Tess is your wife, it's real. That's when it's fucking real, and it couldn't be more satisfying, especially for overly paranoid men like you and me. My mouth is dry by the end of his speech, and I want to hightail it out of this excessively bright kitchen. That's a load of shit. The words rush from my mouth. He walks over and opens a cabinet while talking. Have you ever watched that show Sex in the City? No. Sex in the City, Sex in the City, I don't remember. No, no, and no, I respond. Kim watches it all the time. She has every season on DVD. Christian tears open a box of cookies. It's two in the morning. Tessa is waiting for me, and here I am talking about some shit show. Okay? There's this episode where the women are talking about how you only get two great loves in your life, okay okay. This is getting too fucking weird, I say, turning to go. Tessa is waiting for me. I know I know let me finish really quick. I'll sum it up for you in the most masculine way possible. I turn back to find him looking at me expectantly, so I nod hesitantly. So they were saying that you only get two great loves in your entire life. My point is well. I have sort of lost my point, but I know that Tess is your great love. I'm lost. You said we get two? Well, for you, the other is your own self. He snorts. I thought that was obvious. I raise a brow. And yours were who? Big Mouth and Smith's mom? Watch it he warns. Sorry, Kimberly and Rose. I roll my eyes again. They were yours? You better hope those broads on that show were wrong. Ah, uh, yes. Those two were M mine, he stutters. An emotion flashes across his face, but it disappears, before I can really nail down what it was. Tipping the water bottle to him, I say, well, now that you've made no point whatsoever, I'm going to bed. Yeah, he says, slightly flustered. I don't even know what I'm going on about. I drank too much tonight. Yeah, okay. I leave him alone in the kitchen. I don't know. What the hell? It was all about, but it was odd seeing the one, and only Christian Vance of a loss for words. By the time I get back to the room, Tessa is asleep on her side. Her hands are resting under her cheek, and her knees are tucked up against her body. I flick the light off and set her water bottle on the nightstand, before climbing into bed behind her. Her naked body is warm to my touch, and I can't help but shiver as the tracing of my fingertips causes small goosebumps to rise on her skin. They comfort me, reminding me that my touch, even in her sleep, awakens something in her. Hey, she whispers sleepily. I jump slightly at her voice and nuzzle my head in her neck, pulling her closer to me. We're going to England next weekend, I tell her. She quickly turns her head to look behind her. The room is pretty dark but there's enough moonlight for me to see the shock on her face. What? England. Next weekend. You and me. But, no. You're going. And I know you want to go, so don't try to argue about it. You don't have, Teresa. Let it go. I press my hand over her mouth, and she uses her teeth to softly nip at the skin of my palm. Are you going to be a good girl and keep quiet if I move my hand? I tease her, thinking back to her earlier accusation that I was parenting her. She nods her head, and I let her go. She lifts herself up onto her elbow and turns to face me. I can't possibly hold a conversation with her when she's naked and feisty. But I don't have a passport, she cries out, and I hide my smile. I knew she wasn't done. It's already in the works. We'll figure the rest out tomorrow. But, Teresa two times in one minute? Uh-oh. She grins. You're never drinking champagne again. 
I push her messy hair away from her eyes and trace the shape of her bottom lip with my thumb. You certainly weren't complaining earlier when I was, I silence her drunken mouth by pressing my lips against hers. I love her so much, so fucking much, that it frightens me to think about losing her. Do I really want to mix her, my potential future, the only shot I have at a decent one, with my wicked past? Chapter 118. Tessa. When I wake up, Hardin isn't raped over me, and the room is too bright, even when I close my eyes again. Keeping them closed, I groan, what time is it? My head is throbbing, and even though I know I'm lying down, my body feels like it's swaying back and forth. Noon, Hardin's deep voice says from across the room. Noon. I missed my first two classes. I try to sit up, but my head spins. I fall back onto the mattress with a whimper. You're fine. Go back to sleep. No. I can't miss any more classes, Hardin. I just started classes at this campus, and I can't begin this way. I begin to panic. I'm going to be so behind. I'm sure you'll be fine, Hardin says with a shrug, crossing the room to sit on the bed. You probably already have the assignments completed anyway. He knows me too well. That's not the point. The point is that I missed the lecture, and it makes me look bad. To whom? Hardin asks. I know he is mocking me. To my professors, my classmates. Tessa, I love you, but come on. Your classmates couldn't give less of a fuck if you're there or not. They probably didn't. Even notice. Your professors, yeah, because you're a suck up and they like the ego boosts your fawning gives them. But your classmates don't care, and if they do, then so what? Their opinion doesn't fucking matter. I guess. I close my eyes and try to see his point. I hate being late, missing classes, sleeping until noon. I'm not a suck up, I add. How are you feeling? I feel the mattress shift, and when I open my eyes he's lying next to me. Like I had too much to drink last night. My skull is ready to explode. You certainly did. He nods several times, very seriously. How's your ass feeling? His hand grips my behind, and I wince. We didn't I wasn't that intoxicated was I? No. He chuckles, kneading the skin with his hand. His eyes meet mine. Not yet. I gulp. Only if you want to. You've turned into a fucking vixen, so I assume that would be next on your list. Me, a vixen? Don't look so frightened. It was only a suggestion. He smiles at me. I can't decide how I feel about doing that, and I certainly can't keep up or process this type of conversation right now. But my curiosity gets the best of me. Have you I don't know how to ask the question, this is one of the few things we've never discussed. Him saying dirty things about doing it to me in the heat of the moment doesn't count. Have you done that before? I search his face for the answer. No, actually. I haven't. Oh. I'm too aware of his fingers tapping along the bare skin, where the line of my panties would be, were I wearing any. The fact that Hardin has never experienced that before makes me want to do it, sort of. What are you thinking? I see those wheels turning. He nudges my nose with his, and I smile under his stare. I like that you haven't done it before why? His brow raises, and I hide my face. I don't know. I'm suddenly shy. I don't want to sound insecure, or start a fight. I already have a hangover. Tell me, he demands softly. I don't know. It would just be nice to be your first for something. He lifts himself up on his elbow and looks down at me. What do you mean? I just mean, that you've done a lot of stuff you know, sexually I quietly explain. And I haven't given you any new experiences. He eyes me carefully, as if he's afraid to reply. That's not true. It is, though. I'm pouting again. Like hell it is. That's bullshit, and you know it. His voice is practically a growl, and he's scowling deeply. Don't snap at me, how do you think I feel, that you haven't been with only me? I say. The reminder doesn't come as often as it once did, but when it does, it stings terribly. He winces and gently tugs at both of my arms, to pull me to sit up next to him. Come here. I feel myself being lifted onto his lap, his half-naked body is warm and welcoming underneath my completely bare skin. 
I didn't think of it that way, he says into my shoulder, making me shudder. If you had been with anyone else, I wouldn't be with you now. My head snaps back to look at him. Excuse me? You heard me. He kisses the curve of my shoulder. That's not a very nice thing to say. I'm used to Hardin's unfiltered mouth, but these words surprise me. He can't mean them. I never claim to be nice. I shift my body on his lap and ignore the groan deep in his throat. You're being serious? Very. He nods. So you're telling me, if I hadn't been a virgin, you wouldn't have dated me? This topic isn't one we typically discuss, and I'm nervous to find out where it will lead. His eyes narrow as he regards my expression before muttering, that's exactly what I'm saying. If you recall, I didn't really want to date you anyway. He grins, but I scowl. I press my feet to the floor to lift myself off of his lap, but he holds me in place. Don't pout, he coaxes and attempts to press his lips against mine, but I quickly turn my head. I glare at him. Maybe you shouldn't have dated me, then. I feel overly sensitive, and my feelings are hurt. I add gasoline to the fire and wait for the explosion, maybe you should have just ended it after you won the bet. I stare into his green eyes, waiting for a reaction. Still, it doesn't come. He throws his back in laughter, and my favorite sound fills the room. Don't be such a baby, Hardin says and hugs me tighter, taking both of my wrists in one hand to prevent me from wiggling off his lap. Just because I didn't want to date you in the beginning, doesn't mean that I'm not glad I am. It's still not nice to say, and you said you wouldn't be with me now, if I'd been with someone else. So if I had slept with Noah, before I met you, you wouldn't have dated me? He flinches at the words. No. I wouldn't have. We wouldn't have been in that situation, if you weren't a virgin. He's treading lightly now. Good. Situation, I repeat, still irritated. It comes out harsher than I intended. Yes, situation. He abruptly turns me around and lays me back against the mattress. He moves his body on top of mine and pins my wrists up over my head using only one hand and his knees to push open my thighs. I wouldn't be able to stand it if you'd been touched by another man. I know it's fucking crazy, but that's the damn truth, whether you want to hear it or not. His breath is warm against my face, coming out in hot puffs. Momentarily I forget why I'm annoyed with him. He's being honest, I'll give him that, but it's an obnoxious double standard that he's describing. Whatever. Whatever. He chuckles, tightening his hand around my wrists. He flexes his hips, pressing his boxer-clad body between my thighs. Stop being ridiculous, you know how I am. I feel so exposed right now, and his dominating behavior is turning me on more than it should. He continues. And you know you've given me new experiences. I've never loved anyone, romantically, or even family, really his eyes drift off to ponder what I guess, is a painful memory, but then he quickly returns to me. And I've never lived with anyone. I never gave a fuck about losing anyone before, but when it comes to you, I wouldn't survive it. That's a new experience. His lips ghost over mine. Is that enough new experience for you? I nod, and he smiles. If I lift my head up just a centimeter, my lips will touch his. He seems to read my thoughts and pulls his head back a bit. And don't throw that bet shit in my face again, he threatens, rubbing himself against me. A treacherous moan escapes his mouth and his eyes darken. Got it? Sure. I defiantly roll my eyes at him and he frees my wrists, running his hand down my body, stopping on my hip and squeezing gently. You're being a brat today. He draws circles on my hip, putting more weight on my body. I feel like a brat today. I'm hungover and hormonal. You're being an ass, so I guess we're even, I fire back. He bites the inside of his cheek, then dips his head down to me. Hardin's lips are warm as he kisses me along my jawline, sending a direct line of electricity to my groin. I wrap my legs around his waist and close the small space that's left between our bodies. I've only loved you, he reminds me again, soothing the small ache from his earlier words. His lips reach the base of my neck, and one of his hands cups my breast, while he uses the other to hold his body up. I'll always only love you. I don't speak. I don't want to ruin this moment. 
I love when he's candid about his feelings for me, and for once I can see this. All in a new light. Steph, Molly, and half of the dang campus of WCU may have fooled around with Harden, but none of them, not one single girl, has ever gotten to hear him say I love you. They haven't had, and will never have, the privilege of knowing him, the real him, the way that I do. They have no idea how wonderful and incredibly brilliant he is. They don't get to hear him laugh and watch his eyes screw shut and his dimples pop. They'll never get to hear the snippets of his life or hear the conviction in his voice when he swears that he loves me more than breathing. And for that, I pity them. I've only loved you, I tell him in return. The love I had for Noah wasn't anything beyond family. I know that now. I love Hardin in that all-consuming, incredible way that I know, deep down, I will never feel again. I feel Hardin's hand move to his boxers. He tugs them down, and I use my feet to help him get rid of them. In a gentle motion, he slides into me, crying out as he plunges through the slick opening. Again, he begs. I've only loved you, I repeat. Fucking Christ, Tess, I love you so much. The words are a raw confession as they push through his gritted mouth. I will always only love you, I promise him. I send a silent prayer that we'll find a way to work through all of our problems because I know what I just said is true. It will always be him. Even if something drove us apart. Hardin's thrusts are deep, filling and claiming me as he bites and sucks at the skin on my neck with his warm, wet mouth. I can feel you. Every single inch you're so fucking warm he groans, making it known that he hasn't put a condom on. Even through the euphoric trance, warning bells go off in my head. I blink the sensation away and revel in the feeling of heart and strong muscles straining under my hands as I run my hands over his broad shoulders and inked arms. You have to put one on, I say, though my actions are the opposite of my words. I tighten my legs around his waist, drawing him deeper. My stomach begins to coil, tightening I can't stop his pace quickens, and I think I'll snap in two, if he stops now. Don't, then. We're both insane, not thinking clearly, but I can't stop raking my nails down his back, encouraging him. Fuck, come, Tessa, he instructs me, as if I have a choice. As I reach the brink of orgasm, I'm afraid I may pass out from the amount of pleasure I feel when his teeth graze across my chest, tugging, marking me there. With another groan of my name and a declaration of his love for me, Hardin halts his movements, and he pulls himself out of me, releasing himself onto the bare skin of my stomach. I watch in awe as he touches himself, marking me in the most possessive way while never breaking eye contact. He collapses onto me, shaking and out of breath. We lie in silence, neither of us needing to speak to know what the other is thinking. Where do you want to go? I ask him. I don't even want to leave the bed, but Hardin offering to take me out in Seattle during the day is something that hasn't happened in the past, and I'm not sure if or when it will happen again. I don't give a shit, really. Maybe, like, shopping? His eyes roam my face. Do you need to go shopping? Or want to? I don't really need anything I answer. When I look up and see how nervous he looks lying there next to me, I backtrack. Yeah, sure. Shopping is fine. He's making such an effort. Simple things that couples usually do are completely out of Hardin's comfort zone. I smile at him, remembering the night he took me ice skating to prove that he could, in fact, be a regular boyfriend. It was so much fun, and he was so charming and playful, much like he's been the past week and a half. I don't want a regular boyfriend, I want Hardin, with his crude humor and sour attitude, to take me on simple dates every once in a while and make me feel secure enough in our relationship that the downs will be washed away by the ups. Cool. He shifts uncomfortably. I just need to brush my teeth and tie my hair back. And maybe get rest. He cups the overly sensitive area between my thighs. Hardin has already used one of his shirts to wipe me clean, something he used to do all the time. Right. Maybe I should rinse off in the shower. I gulp, wondering if Hardin and I will go another round before we leave. Frankly, I don't know if either of us could handle it. I stand up from the bed and wince. I knew I was going to be starting my period any day now. Why did it have to come right now, of all days? 
I suppose it works in my favor, though, since it'll be gone by the time we leave for England. Leave for England it doesn't seem real. What? Hardin says with a questioning look. I miss that time I look away from him, knowing that he's had an entire month to store up his jokes. When what time is that? He smirks, looking at his bare wrist, as if there's a watch there. Don't I whine, pressing my thighs together, so I can hurry and put on enough clothes to make it to the bathroom. Would you look at that? A hangover and a bloody attitude, he taunts. Your jokes are terrible. I pull his t-shirt over my head and catch the languid smile he shoots at me as he takes in the sight of me wearing his shirt again. Terrible, ha! Huh? His green eyes dance with amusement. Maybe so terrible that you want to pull the plug on them? I hurry and exit the room while he's still laughing to himself. Chapter 119. Harden. I didn't even know you two were here. I thought Tessa had classes today Kimberly says to me when I enter the kitchen. Why is she even here? She wasn't feeling well I reply. Aren't you supposed to be at work or is staying home another perk of fucking your boss? Actually, I don't feel well either, you ass. She tosses a wadded up piece of paper at me but misses. You and Tessa should really learn how to hold your champagne I tell her. She flips me off. The microwave sounds, and she pulls out a plastic bowl filled with something that looks and smells like cat food, then sits down at the countertop. She inhales forkful after forkful. I lift my fingers to safeguard my nose. That smells like pure shit, I remark. Where's Tessa? She'll shut you up. Wouldn't count on it. I grin. I have sort of come to like taunting Vance's fiancé. She has a thick skin, and she's obnoxious enough that I'm provided with plenty of ammunition. Wouldn't count on what? Tessa joins us in the kitchen dressed in a sweatshirt, tight jeans, and those slipper things she swears are shoes. Really, they're nothing but overpriced cloth wrapped around a piece of cardboard, using the pretense of charity to rip off stupid consumers. She disagrees, of course, so I've learned to keep this opinion to myself. Nothing. I dig my hands into my pockets to fight the urge to nudge Kimberly's smug ass off the stool. He's mouthing off, nothing new. Kim takes another bite of her cat food. Let's go, she's annoying, I say just loud enough for Kim to hear. Be nice, Tessa scolds me. I take her hand in mine and lead her out of the house. When we get into the car, Tessa shoves a handful of plugs into my glove compartment. An idea strikes me. You need to get on birth control, I tell her. I've been so careless lately, and now that I've felt her without a condom, there's no going back. I know. I keep meaning to make a doctor's appointment, but it's hard to get an appointment with student insurance. Sure, sure. Maybe later this week I can get in. I need to do it soon. You're careless lately, she says. Careless? Me? I scoff, trying not to panic. You're the one. That keeps catching me off guard, and I can't think straight. Oh, please. She giggles and leans her head back against the headrest. Hey, if you want to ruin your life by having a child, go for it, but you sure as hell aren't taking me down with you. I squeeze her thigh, and she frowns. What? Nothing, she lies, faking a smile. Tell me, now. Children are something we shouldn't discuss, remember? I agree so let's cut out the middleman and get your ass on birth control, so we don't have to ever talk or worry about children again. I'll find a clinic to go to today, so that your future isn't in jeopardy," she flatly remarks. I've made her upset, but there really isn't a nice way for me to tell her that she needs to get on birth control if she's going to be fucking me multiple times a day whenever we're near each other. After making a few phone calls, she announces, I have an appointment Monday. Good. I run my hand over my hair before placing it back onto her thigh. I turn on the radio and follow the directions on my phone to the nearest mall. By the time we've walked around the mall once, I'm bored out of my mind with Seattle. The only thing keeping me entertained is Tessa. Even when she's quiet, I can read her thoughts just by watching her expressions. I watch her watch people as they rush through the mall. She frowns when an angry mother swats her child's ass in the middle of a store and I guide her out before the scene, and her reaction to it, get out of hand. We have lunch at a quiet pizza parlor, 
and Tessa fills the entire meal with talk about a new book series she's been thinking about reading. I know how judgmental she can be about modern novels, so this surprises and intrigues me. I'll have to download them when I get my e-reader back from you, she says, swiping a napkin across her mouth. I can't wait to have my bracelet back too. And the letter. I force myself not to panic and shove almost an entire piece of pizza into my mouth, so I'm unable to respond. I can't tell her I destroyed it, so I'm really grateful when she moves to another subject. The day ends with Tessa falling asleep in the car. She's made a habit of that lately, and for some reason, I love it. I take the long way back to the house, just like I did the last time. Tessa's alarm didn't wake me, and neither did she. I'm less than pleased that I didn't get to see her before she left this morning, especially since she'll be gone all day. When I glance at the clock on the wall, it shows almost noon. At least she'll be taking lunch soon. I dress quickly and leave the house for the new Vance Publishing branch office. It's strange to think that I could be working there with her, the two of us driving to work together each morning, making the drive back home together we could actually live together again. Space, Harden, she wants space. I laugh at the idea. We aren't giving each other any space, really, only three days a week, tops. What we're doing is just making seeing each other more of a pain in the ass, with the excessive driving and distance. When I get inside the building, I find that the Seattle office is fucking outrageously lavish. It's much bigger than the shit office I worked at. I don't miss working in a stuffy cubicle, that's for damn sure, but this place is nice. Vance wouldn't allow me to work from home. It was Brent, my boss at Bolt House, that recommended I do my work for him from my living room, in order to keep the peace. It works out perfectly for me, even more so now that Tess is in Seattle, so joke is on those overly sensitive fucks in the office. I'm surprised when I don't get lost in this maze of a fucking building. When I reach the reception area, Kimberly beams at me from behind her desk. Hello. How may I help you? She says with emphasis, showing me her ability to remain professional. Where's Tessa? In her office, she says, dropping the facade. And that is I lean against the wall and wait for her to show me to Tessa. Down the hall. Her name is on the plate outside. She glances back to her computer screen, dismissing me. Rude. What exactly does Vance pay her to do? Whatever it is, it must be worth it for him to be able to fuck her on a constant and keep him nearby during the day. I shake my head, ridding it of the images of the two of them. Thanks for your help, I gripe and head down the long narrow hallway. When I reach Tessa's office, I open the door without knocking. The room is empty. I reach into my pocket and grab my phone to call her. Seconds later I hear a rattling noise and see her phone vibrating on her desk. Where the hell is she? I go down the hallway in search of her. I know Zed is in town, and that has me seeing red. I swear to fucking heart in Scott. A woman's voice asks from behind me as I turn and enter what looks like a small break room. I turn around to find a familiar face. Um hey? I can't remember where I've seen her before, but I know that I have. Realization hits me when she's joined by another woman. You've got to be fucking kidding me. The universe is playing a sick fucking joke on me, and it's pissing me the fuck off. Tabitha grins at me. Well 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 Tessa's tales of woe about two bitchy office bullies make so much more sense now. Since clearly neither of us is going to stand on ceremony, I just say, you're the one giving Tessa shit, aren't you? If I had any idea that Tabitha had transferred to the Seattle office, I'd have known instantly that she was the bitch in question. She was known for that back when I worked for Vance, and I'm sure she hasn't changed. What? Me? She flips her hair over her shoulder and smiles. She looks different unnatural, really. The little minion who's following in her wake has the same orange shade to her skin they should stop bathing in food coloring, perhaps. Cut the shit. Don't mess with her. She's trying to adjust to a new city, and you two aren't going to ruin it for her by being assholes to her for no reason. I haven't even done anything. I was joking anyway. Flashes of her sucking my dick in a bathroom stall flash through my mind, and I swallow the uneasy feeling that comes with the unwelcome memory. Don't do it anymore, I warn her. 
I'm not fucking around. Don't even speak to her. Jesus, you're still as cheery as ever, I see. I won't mess with her anymore. I wouldn't want you telling Mr. Vance on me and getting me fired like you did Sam. That wasn't my fault. Yes, it was, she whispers dramatically. As soon as her man found out what you two were doing, what you did she was mysteriously let go the very same week. Tabitha was easy, so damn easy, and so was Samantha. The moment that I found out who Samantha's boyfriend was, she began to appeal to me. But once I got between her legs, I wanted nothing to do with her. That little game of mine caused me a lot of shit and drama that I'd rather not be reminded of, and I sure as hell don't want Tessa mixed up in this catty shit. You don't know half of what really happened, so keep your mouth shut. Leave Tessa alone, and your job will stay yours. Truthfully, I may have had a little something to do with Vance letting Samantha go, but her working there was causing me too many problems. She was only a freshman in college, working part-time, as a copy girl. Speak of the spoiled little devil, the short minion remarks and nods her head toward the door of the small break room. Tessa is smiling and laughing as she enters. And right behind her, dressed in one of his little suits and ties, is fucking Trevor, smiling and laughing along with her. The little twat spots me first and touches Tessa's arm to draw her attention to me. It takes every ounce of my self-control not to snap him in two. When she sees me from across the room, her face lights up, her smile widens, and she rushes over. Only when she reaches me does she notice Tabitha standing next to me. Hey, she says, unsure now, nervous. Bye Tabitha. I wave the snooty woman off. She whispers something to her friend, and the two of them leave the room. Bye, Trevor, I say quietly enough that only Tessa hears. Stop it. She swats my arm in the pestering way that she always does. Hello, Hardin, Trevor greets me, ever so politely. His arm twitches at his side, like he's trying to decide whether or not to offer his hand for a shake. I hope for his sake that he doesn't. I won't accept it. Hi, I say curtly. What are you doing here? Tessa asks. She looks out into the hallway for the two women that just left. I know what she's really asking, how do you know them, and what do they say? Tabitha won't be a problem anymore. She gapes, her eyes wide. What did you do? I shrug. Nothing, I just told her what you should have, to fuck off. Tessa smiles at fucking Trevor, and he sits down at one of the tables, trying not to look at the two of us. I find his discomfort pretty damn amusing. Did you have lunch already? I ask. She shakes her head. Let's get you something to eat, then. I give the eavesdropper a fuck you glare and lead Tessa out of the room and down the hallway. The place next door has really good tacos, she says. It turns out she's wrong. The tacos are shit, but she devours her plate and most of mine. Afterward, she flushes and blames her appetite on her hormones, when she threatens to shove a tampon down my throat, if I make one more joke about her period, I just laugh. I still want to go back tomorrow to see everyone and get my stuff, she says washing down the spicy salsa she just finished with some water. Don't you think going to England next weekend is enough traveling? I say, trying to derail her plans. No. I want to see Landon. I miss him so much. An unwarranted pang of jealousy hits me, but I brush it off. He is her only friend, save annoying ass Kimberly. He'll still be there when we get back from England hard and please. She looks up at me, not asking for permission like she sometimes does. This time she's asking for my cooperation, and I can tell by the gleam in her eye that she's going back to see Landon whether I want her to or not. Fine. Fuck, I groan. This can't possibly go well. I look across the table at her, and she's smiling proudly, I don't know if she's proud of herself for winning this argument or proud of me for giving in, but she looks so beautiful. So relaxed. I like that you came here today. She takes my hand as we walk down the busy street. Why are there so many people in Seattle? Do you do? I figured as much, but I had a little anxiety that she might be angry at me for showing up unannounced, not that I would have given a shit, but still. Yes. She blinks up at me, stopping in the middle of a swarm of rushing bodies. 
I almost she trails off without finishing. You almost what? I stop her attempt at walking farther and pull her to the wall beside a jewelry store. The sun reflects off the enormous diamond rings on display in the window, and I lead her a few feet down the brick wall to get away from the glare. It's silly. She pulls her bottom lip between her teeth and stares at the cement. But I feel like I can breathe for the first time in months. Is that a good thing or I start to ask, tilting her chin, so she has no choice but to look at my face. Yes, it's a good thing. I feel like for once everything is working out. I know it hasn't been for long, but this is the most functional we have ever been. We've only had a handful of arguments, and we communicated our way through them. I'm proud of us. Her comment amuses me, because we still argue and banter constantly. It's not only a handful of arguments, but she's right, we've been talking our way through things. I love that we argue, and I think she does too. We're totally different people, we couldn't be more different, really and getting along with her all the time would be boring as hell. I couldn't live without her constant need to correct me or her nagging about my mess making. She's annoying as hell, but I wouldn't change a fucking thing about her. Except her need to be in Seattle. Functional is highly overrated, baby. To prove my point, I lift her by the thighs, wrapping her legs around my waist, and kiss her against the wall right in the middle of one of the busiest streets in Seattle. Chapter 120 Tessa. How much longer? Hardin complains from the passenger seat. Less than five minutes. We just passed Connors. I know he's well aware of how short the distance is from here to the apartment. It's just that he can't keep himself from complaining. Hardin drove most of the way until I finally persuaded him to let me finish the trip. His eyes were nearly closing, and I knew he needed a break. My point was proven when he stretched his arm across the center console holding me as best he could, while I was driving, and fell asleep almost instantly. Landon is still there, right? Do you talk to him? I ask. I'm beyond excited to see my best friend. It's been far too long, and I miss his kind words of wisdom, and never faltering smile. Yes, for the tenth time, Harding replies, clearly annoyed. He's been anxious the entire drive, even though he won't admit it. He shrugs it off like he's annoyed because of the distance, but I get the feeling there's something else behind his frustration. I'm not entirely sure that I want to discover what it is. When I pull into the parking lot of the apartment building that I used to call home, my stomach turns and my nervousness begins to creep to the surface. It'll be fine. Hardin's reassuring words surprise me as we enter the front door. The small elevator feels so alien as it rises up the building. It feels as if so much more than only three weeks have passed. Hardin keeps his hand over mine until we reach the door, where he slides the key into the lock and pushes it open. Landon jumps to his feet from the couch and strides across the room with the brightest smile I've seen him wear in the seven months since we became friends. His arms wrap around my back and he hugs me, welcoming me and making me aware of just how much I've missed him. Before I know it, I'm sobbing and heaving deep breaths into my friend's chest. I'm not sure why I'm crying so much. I've just missed Landon terribly, and his warm reaction to my return made me emotional. Can her old man get a turn? I hear my father say from somewhere a little ways off. Landon starts to back away, but Hardin says, in a moment, and nods toward Landon, assessing my mental state. I launch myself at Landon again and his familiar arms wrap around my back again. I missed you so much, I tell him. His shoulders visibly relax, and he unwraps his arms from my body. When I go to hug my father, Landon stays nearby, his smile still bright and loving as ever. Looking at my father, I realize that he must have known that I'd be coming to visit. It looks like he's wearing Landon's clothes, and they're tied on his body. I notice that his face is clean-shaven. Look at you. I exclaim with a smile. No beard. He whoops a loud laugh and hugs me tighter. Yeah, no more beard for me, he says. How was the drive? Landon asks, shoving his hands into the pockets of his navy-colored slacks. Shit, Hardin says at the exact moment I say, good. Landon and my father both laugh, Hardin looks annoyed, 
and I'm just happy to be home with my best friend and the closest relative that I'm in contact with. Which only reminds me that I have to call my mother, which I keep putting off. I'm going to put your bag in the bedroom, Hardin announces, leaving the three of us to continue our welcoming. I watch as he disappears into the room we once shared. His shoulders are set low, and I want to follow after him, but I don't. I've missed you too much, Tessie. How's Seattle treating you, my father asks. It's odd to look at him now, wearing one of Landon's collared shirts and dress slacks, with no hair on his face. He looks like a completely different man. The bags under his eyes have gotten puffier, though, and I notice the way his hands are slightly shaking at his sides. It's good, I'm still getting used to it, I tell him. He smiles. That's good to hear. Landon steps closer to me as my father takes a seat on the edge of the couch. He turns his back away from my father, as if he wants to keep our conversation private. It feels like you've been gone for months, he says, holding my gaze as he speaks. He looks tired, too maybe from staying at the apartment with my father? I don't know, but I want to find out. It does, I feel like time is strange in Seattle, how's everything? I feel like we've barely talked. It's true. I haven't called Landon as often as I should have, and he must have been really busy dealing with his last semester at Washington Central. If less than three weeks is this tough, how will I be able to bear him moving all the way to New York? I knew you'd be busy, everything's okay, he says. His eyes dart to the wall, and I sigh. Why do I feel like I'm missing something obvious? Are you sure? I glance back and forth between my best friend and my father, taking in Landon's drained expression. Yeah, we'll talk about it later, he says, waving my concern off. Now tell me about Seattle. The dim light that was in his eyes intensifies into a bright burn of happiness, the happiness that I have missed so much. It's okay I trail off, and his forehead creases in a frown. Really, it's okay. Much better now that Hardin is visiting more. So much for space, huh, he playfully teases, nudging my shoulder with the palm of his hand. Do you two have the strangest definition of breaking up? I roll my eyes, agreeing, but I say, it's been really nice having him there. I'm still as confused as ever, but Seattle feels more like the Seattle of my dreams, when Hardin is there with me. I'm happy to hear it. Landon smiles, his gaze shifting as Hardin walks up and stands next to me. Looking around, I say to the three of them, this place is in much better condition than I thought it would be. We've been cleaning it, while Hardin was in Seattle, my father says, and I laugh, reminded of Hardin's grumpy complaint that the two of them were messing with his things. I look back at the well-organized foyer, remembering the very first time I stepped through the door with Hardin. I fell in love instantly with the old-fashioned charm of the place, the exposed brick wall was so enchanting, and I was beyond impressed by the expansive book shelving covering the far wall. The concrete flooring added to the personality of the apartment, unique and beautiful. I couldn't believe that Hardin had chosen the most perfect space, suiting both of us in a way I didn't think was possible. It wasn't extravagant, not in the slightest, but it was so beautiful, and so thoughtfully laid out. I remember how nervous he was that I wouldn't like it. I was nervous too, though. I thought he was insane for wanting to me live with him so soon into our back and forth relationship, and I now know that my apprehensiveness was very well justified. Hardin had used this apartment as a trap. He thought that I'd be forced to stay with him, after I found out about the wager he'd made with his group of friends. In a way, it worked, and I don't particularly love that part of our past, but I wouldn't change it now. Despite the memories of our happy first days here, for some reason I still can't shake the unsettling rustling that I feel in my stomach. I feel like a stranger here now. The once charming brick wall has been stained by bloody knuckles too many times to count, the books on those shelves have been witness to too many screaming matches, the pages have soaked up too many tears in the aftermath of our endless fighting, and the image of Hardin crumpled on his knees in front of me is so strong it's practically imprinted into the floor. This place is no longer the treasure to me that it once was, and these walls now hold memories of sadness and betrayal, not only Hardin's, but Steph's as well. What's wrong? Hardin asks the moment my expression turns melancholy. 
Nothing, I'm fine, I tell him. I want to shake off the unpleasant memories lodging in my mind, taking away from these moments of happiness at being reunited with Landon and my father after the lonely weeks I've endured in Seattle. I'm not buying it, Hardin huffs, but drops it and walks into the kitchen. After a second, his voice travels into the living room. Is there no food in the place? Ah, here it goes. It had been so nice and quiet, my father whispers to Landon, and they share a friendly laugh. I'm so thankful to have Landon in my life, and to have what seems to be a budding relationship with my father, though it seems that Hardin and Landon both know him better than I do. I'll be back in just a minute, I say. I want to change out of this heavy sweatshirt. It's too warm in this small apartment, and I feel my lungs yearning for a fresh breath as the moments pass. I need to read Hardin's letter again. It's my favorite thing in the entire world. It's much more than a thing to me. It expresses his love and passion in a way that his mouth never could. I've read it so many times that I have it memorized, but I need to physically touch it again. Once I hold the tattered and worn pages between my fingers, all the anxiety I'm feeling will be replaced by his thoughtful words, and I'll be able to breathe again and enjoy my weekend here. I search the top of the dresser and each drawer before moving along to the desk. My fingers push through piles of paper clips and pens to no avail. But where else could he have placed it? I find my e-reader and the bracelet resting on top of my religion journal, but the letter is nowhere to be found. After placing the bracelet on the desk, I move to the closet and search through the empty shoebox that Hardin uses to store his work files during the week. I lift the lid to find it empty except one single piece of paper, which, I'm sad to see, is not the letter. What is this, though? Hardin's handwriting is scribbled across it from top to bottom, and if I wasn't so worried about my letter, I would stop to check it out. It's really weird that this paper is randomly here. I make a mental note to come back and read the scribbles on that page and put the lid back onto the box and store it back where I found it. Worrying that I may have overlooked the letter in the drawer, I march back to the dresser. What if Hardin threw it away? No, he wouldn't. He knows how much that letter means to me. He'd never do that. I pull my old journal out once more, turn it upside down, and shake it, hoping the letter will fall out. I'm beginning to panic, until a flicker of white catches my attention. It's a shred of paper, twirling through the air between my journal and the floor. I reach down, and pick it up just as it lands on the floor. I recognize the words immediately, they're practically etched into my mind. It's only half a sentence, almost too small to read, but the ink-smeared words are clearly written in Hardin's handwriting. My stomach drops. I stare at the fragment of paper, and the realization hits me. I just know that he did, in fact, destroy it. I begin to weep and let the shred slip from my shaking fingers and fall back to the floor. My heart is instantly broken, and I begin to wonder just how much one heart can bear. Chapter 121. Hardin. You're free to go. I release Landon from his babysitting duties. I'm not going, she just got here, he replies, challenging me. I guess he's one of the biggest reasons, if not the only reason, that she wanted to come to this damn place at all. Fine, I huff and lower my voice. How was he, while I was gone? I quietly ask. He was good. He's less shaky and he hasn't thrown up since yesterday morning. Fucking junkie. I run my hands over my hair. Fuck. Calm down, it's all going to work out, my stepbrother assures me. I ignore his words of wisdom and leave him in the kitchen to find Tessa. When I reach the bedroom door, I hear a strangled sob coming from inside. I take a quick step forward to find her with both hands cupped over her mouth her blue eyes bloodshot and full of tears as they stare down at the floor. One more step is all it takes for me to spot what it is that she's looking at. Fuck. Fuck. Tess. I had planned on coming up with a plan to fix the problem that I created by ripping up that damned letter, but I just haven't had the chance yet. I was going to find the pieces that were left and try to tape them back together, or at least tell Tessa what I did before she found out on her own too late now. Tess, I'm sorry. The apology tumbles out as tears roll down her tear-stained cheeks. Why did you she sobs, 
Unable to finish the sentence. My heart constricts in my chest. For a brief moment, I'm convinced that I'm hurting worse than she is. I was so mad after you left me I begin to explain, walking over to her, but she backs away. I don't blame her. I wasn't thinking properly, and it was there, on the bed, where you left it. She doesn't speak or look away from me. I am so sorry, I swear it. I frantically proclaim. As she chokes, furiously wiping at her cheeks. I just need a minute, okay? Her eyes close, and a few more tears escape from under her fluttering eyelids. I want to give her a minute like she asked, but I'm selfishly afraid that she'll grow more and more hurt as time passes and decide she doesn't want to see me. I'm not going to leave the room, I say. She has both her hands pressed over her mouth, but even so, I hear her let out a muffled cry. The sound cuts straight through me. Please, she begs through her pain. I knew she'd be hurt when she found out about me destroying that letter, but what I didn't expect was for it to hurt me so much. No, I won't. I refuse to leave her in here alone to cry over my mistakes, again. How many times has that happened in this apartment? She looks away from me and sits down at the foot of the bed, her shaky hands clasped on her lap, her eyes half closed, and her lips quivering as she tries to calm herself down. I ignore the push of her hand against my chest when I drop to my knees in front of her and wrap my arms around her body. After a few exhausted efforts to push me away, she finally gives in and allows me to comfort her. I'm so sorry, baby, I repeat. I don't know if I've ever meant those words so sincerely before. I love that letter, she says, crying into my shoulder. It meant so much to me. I know it did. I'm so sorry. I don't even try to defend myself because I'm a fucking idiot and I knew how much that thing meant to her. I gently push her back by her shoulders and take her tear-stained cheeks between my hands and lower my voice. I don't know what to say except I'm sorry. Finally she opens her mouth to speak. I won't say it's okay because it's not her eyes are red-rimmed and already swollen from her sobbing. I know. I bow my head, dropping my hands from her face. Moments later I feel her fingers press under my chin, tilting my face up to look at her, the way I usually do to her. I'm upset devastated, really, she says. But there's nothing I can do about it, and I don't want to sit here and cry all weekend, and I certainly don't want you backtracking and beating yourself up over it. She's trying her hardest to talk herself up, pretending that it doesn't bother her the way that I know it does. I let out a breath that I didn't realize I was holding. I'll make it up to you, somehow. When she doesn't answer, I press a little. Okay? She wipes at her eyes, her makeup smearing under her fingertips. Her silence is making me uneasy. I'd rather be screamed at than have her cry like this. Tess, please talk to me. Do you want me to take you back to Seattle? Even if she says yes, I sure as hell won't do it, but the offer is tossed between us before I can think it through. No. She shakes her head. I'm fine. With a sigh, she stands, sidestepping my body as she exits the bedroom. I get to my feet and follow her. She closes the bathroom door, and I go back into the bedroom to grab her small bag. I know her, she'll want to fix that black smudged mess underneath her eyes. I tap on the bathroom door, and she opens it slightly, just enough for me to shove the small bag through. Thanks, she says, her voice small defeated. I've already ruined her weekend, and it's barely started. My mom and your dad want you to bring Tessa by the house tomorrow, Landon calls from the end of the hall. And I'm just saying. My mom misses Tessa. So your mom can see her some other time. Then I realize this might get Tessa's mind off that damned letter. You know what? Fine, I say before he can get his response out. I'll take her by tomorrow. My stepbrother tilts his head. Is he crying? She's it's not really any of your business, is it? I snap. You've been back here for less than 20 minutes, and she's already locked herself in the bathroom, he says, crossing his arms. This isn't the time to start shit with me, Landon, I growl. I'm already at the point of explosion. The last thing I need is you butting your damn nose in where it doesn't belong. But he just rolls his eyes in a very Tessa-like way. Oh, 
So I'm only allowed to button when it involves doing a favor for you? What the fuck is his problem? And why do I keep referring to him as my stepbrother? Fuck off. She's probably already overwhelmed, so the two of us need to stop this before she lets herself out of that bathroom. He's trying to reason with me. Fine, then stop talking shit to me, I say. Before he can respond, the bathroom door clicks open, and Tessa, looking put together but very exhausted, shuffles into the hallway, worry on her face. What's going on? Nothing. Landon is going to order pizza, and we're all going to spend the remainder of the night as one big happy family. I glance at him. Isn't that right? Yes, he agrees, for Tessa's sake, I know. I miss the days when Landon wouldn't smart off to me. They were few and far between, but he's grown balsier as the months have dragged on. Or maybe I've grown weaker I haven't a damn clue, but I don't like the shift. Tessa lets out a little sigh. I need her to smile, I need to know she can get over this. So I say, I'm going to take you by my father's house tomorrow, maybe Karen can share some recipes or some shit with you. Her eyes lighten, and she grins, finally. Recipes or some shit? She chews on the corner of her bottom lip to keep from grinning further. The pressure in my chest dissolves. Yeah, or some shit. I smile back at her, and lead her to the living room, where we are set to enjoy a torturous night of entertaining Richard and Landon. Richard is lying across the span of the couch. Landon is in the chair. And Tessa and I are sitting on the floor. Can you pass me another Supreme? Richard asks for the third time, since we started this hideous movie. I look at Tessa and Landon, who, of course, are completely fascinated by the email love affair that's going on between Meg Ryan and Tom Hanks. If this were a modern movie, they would have fucked after the first email, not waited until the last scene to even kiss. Hell, they would have been on one of those hookup apps, and maybe only known each other by screen names. How depressing is that? Here, I groan, sliding the pizza box to Richard. He's already taking up the entire couch, and now he's interrupting me every 10 minutes for more fucking pizza. This last part used to make your mom cry every time she saw it. Richard's hand reaches out and squeezes Tessa's shoulder. I try my best not to scoot between them or bat his hand away. If she had any idea what her father has been doing the last week, if she had watched the drugs leave his system in a mess of vomit and convulsing withdrawals, she'd push his hand away herself and then sanitize her shoulder. Really? Tess looks up at her father with glossy eyes. Yes. I still remember you two watching it every time it was on. More around the holidays, of course. Was that, I begin but halt my vicious words, before I utter them. What? Tessa asks me. Was that um, dog supposed to be there? I dumbly ask. It makes no sense, but Tessa, being Tessa, goes into full discussion mode about the last scene of the movie, and that the dog, Barkley, or Brinkley, I believe she said his name is, is essential to the success of the movie. Blah 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 a knock at the door stops Tessa's explanation and Landon gets up to answer. I got it, I say and push past him. This is my fucking place, after all. I don't bother to look through the peephole, but once I pull the door open, I wish that I had. Where's he, the foul-smelling junkie asks. I step out into the hallway and close the door behind me. Tessa will not be bothered by this shit. What the fuck are you doing here? I hiss. I'm just here to see my buddy, that's all. Chad's teeth are even browner than before, and his facial hair is matted to his skin. He can only be in his 30s, but he possesses the face of a man pushing 50. The watch my father got me is hanging from his filthy wrist. He's not coming out here, and no one is giving you anything, so I suggest you take your ass back, where you came from before I bash your face against that railing, I say matter-of-factly and point toward the metal bar in front of the hallway fire extinguisher. Then, while you're bleeding out, I'll call the police and have you arrested for possession and trespassing. I know he has drugs on him, the fucking asshole. His eyes focus in on me, and I take a step toward him. I wouldn't test my patience, not tonight, I warn. His mouth opens just as the door to the apartment opens behind me. Fucking hell. What's going on? Tessa asks moving in front of me. 
I instinctively jerk her back, and she asks again. Nothing Chad here was just leaving. I stare at Chad, so help him God, if he fucking, Tessa's eyes narrow in on the shiny object dangling from his thin wrist. Is that your watch? What? No, I begin to lie, but she already knows. She isn't stupid enough to think it's coincidence that this drug addict fuck has the same exact expensive ass watch as I do. Hard and she glares at me. So what, you've been hanging out with this guy or something? She crosses her arms and puts more distance between us. No. I half shout. Why would that be the conclusion she draws from this little scene? I'm conflicted between calling her father out and defending myself or making up yet another lie. I'm not friends with him, he's leaving. I shoot Chad one more warning. This time he takes it and backs away down the hall. I suppose it's only Landon who isn't intimidated by me anymore. Maybe I haven't lost my edge after all. Who's there? Richard joins us in the hallway. That man Chad, Tessa answers, inquisition clear in her tone. Oh Richard pales and looks helplessly at me. I need to know what's going on. Tessa is getting upset. I shouldn't have let her come back here. I saw it on her face the moment she stepped into this damn place. Landon. Tessa calls for her best friend, and I look at her father. Landon will tell her everything. He won't lie to her face the way I have so many times. Your dad owed him money, and I gave him that watch for payment, I admit. She gasps and turns to Richard. You owed him money for what? Hardin's father gave him that watch as a gift, she shouts. Okay this isn't exactly the reaction I was expecting. She's more focused on the stupid watch than the whole your father owed this creep money aspect. I'm sorry Tessie. I didn't have any money, and Hardin, before I realize what she's doing, she's halfway to the elevator. What the fuck? I panic, running after her, but she slides into the steel cage, just before I reach her. Those doors move with torturous slowness any other time, yet when she's escaping from me, they close instantly. God damn it, Tessa. I pound my fist once against the metal. Does this place even have a staircase? When I look back down the hall, Landon and Richard are both staring blankly, unmoving. Thanks for the fucking help, assholes. I move quickly and find a staircase, taking two stairs at a time to get to the bottom. I reach the lobby and glance around for Tessa. When I don't see her, I begin to panic again. Chad could have friends with him, they could approach Tessa, or her to the elevator opens with a ding, and Tessa steps out of it, the most determined face imaginable covers her features, until she spots me. Are you out of your fucking mind? I shout at her, my voice filling the lobby. He's giving that damn watch back, Hardin, she shouts back. She stalks toward the glass doors, and I wrap my arm around her waist yanking her back against my chest. Get off of me. She claws at my arms, but I don't relent. You can't just chase after him. What are you thinking? She keeps fighting me. If you don't stop moving, I will literally carry your ass back up to the apartment. Now listen to me, I say. He can't have that watch, Hardin. Your father gave it to you, and it meant a lot to him and to you. That watch didn't mean shit to me, I say. Yes, it did. You'll never admit it, but it did. I know it. Her eyes are watering again. Fuck, this weekend is going to be hell. No, it didn't did it? Her hands stop moving, and she settles down slightly. I gently coax her back toward the elevator, her drug dealer chasing mission aborted, much to her chagrin. It's not fair to you that he took that watch because of some stupid bar tab my father ran up. How much freaking alcohol does one consume? that they actually owe people money. Her temper is flaring, and I'm torn between thinking it's amusing and feeling terrible for what I have to tell her. It wasn't alcohol, Tess. I watch as she tilts her head to the side, looking anywhere and everywhere but at my eyes. Hardin, I know my father and his drinking, don't make excuses for him. Her chest is moving up and down at an unhealthy pace. Tessa, Tessa, you have to calm down. Then tell me what's going on, Hardin. I don't know what else to say. I'm sorry, sorry that I couldn't shield her from her fuck-up of a father, just like I couldn't shield my mother from the devastation of mine. So I do something. Rather alien for me. 
I say something brutally honest. It's not alcohol. It's drugs. Tessa's reaction seems at first like no reaction at all. But after a second, she shakes her head and says, no, he's not he's not doing drugs. Quickly she steps into the elevator and punches the button for our floor. I jump on right after her, but she just stares into space as the doors close us in. Chapter 122. Tessa. As Hardin and I walk back into the apartment, it feels like the air has become stale and awkward. Are you okay? Landon asks when Hardin closes the door behind him. Yeah, I state simply, lying. I'm confused, hurt, angry, and exhausted. It's only been a few hours since we arrived, and already I'm ready to go back to Seattle. Any thought I had of wanting to live here again vanished somewhere during the silent walk from the elevator to the apartment door. Tessie I didn't mean for any of this to happen, my father says as he follows me into the kitchen. I need a glass of water. My head is throbbing. I don't want to talk about it. The sink creaks when I pull at the faucet, and I wait patiently for the glass to fill. I think we should at least talk, please I turn to face him. I don't want to talk. I don't want to hear the hideous truth, or some well-intentioned lie. I only want to go back to when I was cautiously excited about trying out a relationship with my father that I never had as a child. I know that Hardin has no reason to lie about my father's addictions, but perhaps he's somehow mistaken. Tessie my father pleads. She said she doesn't want to talk about it, Hardin insists, suddenly appearing in the room. He walks farther into the kitchen and stands between my father and me. I'm thankful for his intrusion this time, but I'm slightly worried over the quick movements of his chest as his breaths become more shallow and labored. I'm grateful when my father sighs in defeat and leaves me alone with Hardin in the kitchen. Thank you. I sag against the counter and take another drink of the lukewarm tap water. A worried line forms along Hardin's forehead, and he doesn't attempt to hide his deep scowl. His fingers press against his temples, and he leans against the opposite counter. I shouldn't have let you come here. I knew this would happen. I'm fine. You always say that. Because I always have to be. Otherwise, when the next disaster occurs, I won't be prepared. The adrenaline coursing through me only minutes ago has disappeared, evaporated along with the hope that for once, something could go right for an entire weekend. I don't regret coming here, because I've missed Landon so much, and I wanted to pick up my letter, e-reader, and bracelet. My heart still aches over the letter, it doesn't seem rational for an object to hold such significance to me, but it does. It was the first time Hardin had ever been so open with me no more hiding, no more secrets about his past, all of his cards were on the table and, I didn't have to force the confessions from him. The thought that he put into writing it and the way his hands shook as he held it out to me will always remain in my mind. I'm not upset with him, really. I wish he hadn't destroyed it, but I know his temper, and I'm the one who left it here, somehow sensing that he probably would destroy it. I won't allow myself to dwell on it anymore, though it still hurts to think about the shred of paper that was left. That small piece could never hold all of the emotion packed into the words he had scribbled across the page. I hate that it's like that for you, Hardin quietly says. Me too. I sigh in agreement. The pained look on his face makes me add, it's not your fault. Like hell it isn't. Exasperated fingers push through the wave of his hair. I'm the one who ripped up that damn letter, I drove you here, and I thought I could keep your father's habits from you. I thought that asshole Chad was gone for good, when I gave him my watch for the money your dad owed. I stare at Hardin, who's always so wound up, and I want to hug him. He gave away something of his, regardless of his claims to have no attachment to the object, he gave it up in an attempt to dig my father out of the hole he created for himself. God, I love him. I'm very grateful to have you, I tell him. His shoulders straighten, and his head quickly lifts to look at me. I don't know why. I create nearly every disaster in your life. No, I'm equally to blame, I assure him. I wish he thought more of himself. If only he could see himself the way that I do. The indifference of the universe does a lot too. You're lying, he stares at me with expectant eyes, but I'll take it. I stare at the wall in silence, my brain running over a thousand thoughts per minute. I'm still angry, 
that you ran after him like a fucking madman, though, Hardin scolds me. I don't blame him. It wasn't smart. But I also somehow knew he'd run after me in my ridiculous attempt to chase Chad down and take the watch back from him. What the heck was I thinking? I was thinking that the watch represented the beginning of a new relationship between Hardin and his father. Hardin said he hated that watch and he refused to wear it, claiming it was outrageous. He's unaware of the times I passed the bedroom to see him staring at it in its box. Once he even had the watch resting in his open palm, examining it closely, as if it might burn or heal him. His expression was ambivalent when he tossed it carelessly back into the oversized black box. My adrenaline got the best of me. I shrug, trying to hide the gentle tremor shaking through me at the thought of actually catching up to the hideous man. I had a bad feeling about him the first time he came to pick my father up from the apartment, but I was unaware of the possibility that he'd return. Out of all the suspicions I held relating to what exactly was happening here, slimy men selling drugs and being paid in watches was never a thought. This obviously was what Hardin referred to as taking care of it without me having to worry about it. If I had just kept my behind in the apartment, I could still be blissfully ignorant of the entire situation. I could still see my father in a decent light. Well, I don't care much for your adrenaline, then. It obviously cuts off the oxygen to your damn brain, Hardin huffs, glaring at the refrigerator beside me. Should we start the next movie? My father's voice sounds from the living room. I shoot a sudden panic look toward Hardin, and he opens his mouth to answer for me. In a minute, he replies, his tone harsh. Hardin looks down at me, his heightened irritated expression overpowering me. You don't have to go out there and fake some bullshit conversation with them if you don't want to. I dare either of them to say shit to you about it. The idea of watching a movie with my father does not sound the least bit appealing but I don't want things to be awkward, and I don't want Landon to go just yet. I know. I sigh. You're in denial, and I get that, but you're going to need to face the music sooner or later. His words are harsh, but his eyes are sympathetic as he gazes down at me. I feel the heat of his fingers trail down the back of both of my arms. I'll take later, for now, I plead with him, and he nods, not approving but accepting my denial. For now. Go on and go in there, then. I'll be in in a minute. He tilts his head toward the living room. Okay, can you make some popcorn? I smile up at him, trying my best to convince him that my heart isn't hammering against my ribcage and my palms aren't sweating. You're pushing it a playful smile tugs at the corners of his mouth while he pushes me out of the kitchen. Go on. When I enter the dimly lit living room, my father is sitting in his usual spot on the couch and Landon is standing, leaning against the dark brick wall. My father's hands are on his lap, he's picking at the skin on his fingertips, a habit I had as a child until my mother forced me to give it up. Now I know where it came from. My father lifts dark eyes from his lap to peer up at me, and a chill runs over me. I can't decipher whether it's the lighting or my mind playing tricks on me, but his eyes are nearly black and it's making me nauseous. Is he really taking drugs? If so, how much and what kind? My knowledge of drugs consists of having watched a few episodes of Intervention with Hardin. I cringed and covered my eyes when the addicts would push the needles into their skin or smoke the frothy liquid off of a spoon. I could barely stand to watch them destroy themselves and everyone around them while Hardin went on about not feeling an ounce of pity for the fucking junkies. Is my father really one of them? I'll understand if you want me to go my father's voice doesn't match the look in his haunted eyes. It's small, weak, and broken. My chest aches. No, it's okay. I swallow and sit down on the floor to wait for Hardin to join us. I hear the quiet popping of the kernels, and the aroma of popping corn has already filled the apartment. I'll tell you anything you want to, it's okay, really. I assure my father with a smile. Where is Hardin? My silent question is answered only moments later, when he strides into the living room, a bag of popcorn in one hand, and my glass of water in the other. He sits down next to me on the floor without a word, and places the bag on my lap. It's a little burned, but still edible, he quietly remarks. His eyes move straight to the television screen, 
and I know he's holding back many thoughts. I squeeze his hand to thank him for keeping them that way. I don't think I'd be able to handle anything else tonight. The popcorn is delicious and buttery. Harding gripes when I offer Landon and my father some. I suspect that's why they refuse it. What bullshit are we watching now? Hardin asks. Sleepless in Seattle, I answer with a grin. His eyes roll. Really? Isn't that like an older version of what we just watched? I can't help but be amused. It's a lovely movie. Sure. He looks at me, but his eyes don't stay on mine, as long as usual. He uses his sweatshirt to wipe the greasy butter off his fingers. I cringe and make a mental note to soak the shirt longer than usual tomorrow before I wash it. Is something wrong? This movie isn't that bad, I whisper to him. My father is finishing off the remainder of the pizza, and Landon has taken his seat back on the recliner. No. He still doesn't look at me. I don't want to comment on his odd behavior. Everyone's already on edge from tonight's events. The movie distracts me from myself and my vicious mind long enough to laugh with Landon and my father. Hardin stares at the screen, his shoulders stiff again, and his mind miles away. I desperately want to ask him what's wrong so that I can fix it, but I know that it's best to leave him be for now. Instead, I snuggle against his chest with my knees, bent beneath me, and one arm wrapped around his lean torso. He surprises me by pulling me closer and planting a soft kiss on my hair. I love you, he whispers. I'm nearly convinced that I'm hearing voices until I look up into his expectant green eyes. I love you, I reply softly. I take a few moments to stare at him, just to take in how beautiful he is. He drives me insane, as I do him, but he loves me, and his calm behavior tonight is just another indication of that. No matter how forced the behavior is, he is trying, and in that I find solace, a steady certainty, that even in the middle of the brewing storm, he will be my anchor. I once feared that he would take me under, now I don't even mind if he does. The heavy knock at the door jolts me from Hardin's lap. I've somehow migrated there in my near slumber, and he unwraps his arms from around me and gently places me on the floor so he can stand up. I study his face, looking for anger or shock, but instead he looks worried. You're not moving, he says to me. I nod in agreement. I don't want to face Chad again. We should just call the police, otherwise he'll never stop coming here. I groan, wondering how this apartment could have changed so drastically in the last few weeks. The panic rises into my chest again, and when I look up to gauge my father and Landon's reactions to the intruder, I see that they're both asleep. The television is set on the menu screen for the pay-per-view. We must have all actually drifted off to sleep without realizing it. No, I hear Hardin say. I rise onto my knees when he reaches the door. What if Chad isn't alone? Will he try to hurt Hardin? I stand up and head toward the couch to wake my father. I barely register the heavy click of high heels across the hard flooring, so when I turn my head and see my mother in all her tight red dress, curled hair, and red lipstick glory, I'm shocked. Her beautiful face is set in a deep scowl as her darkening eyes meet mine. What are you? I begin. I glance at Hardin, and he's calm expectant almost he allows her to storm past him and stalk toward me. You called her? My voice squeaks as the puzzle pieces click into place. He looks away from me. How could he call her? He knows firsthand how my mother is. Why on earth would he bring her into this? You have been avoiding my calls. Teresa, she snaps. And now I find out that your father is here. At this apartment, and he's on drugs. She storms past me too, and goes straight for the kill. Her fire engine red manicured fingers grip my father's arm, and she yanks his sleeping body off of the couch. He topples to the floor. Get up Richard, she booms, and I flinch at the harshness in her voice. My father scrambles up to a sitting position quickly using his palms to support his body weight, and shakes his head. His eyes nearly pop out of his skull as he takes in the woman in front of him. I watch as he blinks rapidly, and stumbles to his feet. Carol? His voice is even smaller than mine. How dare you? She waves a finger in his face, 
and he backs away from her, only to have his legs hit the couch, causing him to fall back. He looks terrified, and I don't blame him. Landon stirs in the chair and opens his eyes. His expression mimics my father's, confused and terrified. Teresa, go to your bedroom, my mother demands. What? No, I will not, I counter. Why did Hardin have to call her? Everything would have been okay. I'd have a way to move on from my father, probably. She's not a child anymore, Carol, my father says. My mother's cheeks puff and her chest rises and I know what's coming next. Don't you dare speak of her as if you know her at all. As if you have any claim on her. I'm trying to make up for lost time. My father is holding his ground pretty decently for a man who has just been awoken by his angry ex-wife screaming in his face. I don't know what to make of the scene unfolding in front of me. There's something in my father's voice, something in his tone as he steps closer to my mother, gaining confidence that almost looks familiar. I can't quite put my finger on it. Lost time. You don't get to make up for lost time. Now I hear you're taking drugs? I'm not anymore, he yells back at her. I want to cower behind Hardin, but right now I don't know whose side he's actually on. Landon's eyes are focused on me, Hardin's on my father and mother. Wanna go? Landon mouths silently from across the room. I shake my head, silently declining, but hoping that my eyes can convey how thankful I am for his offer. Anymore? Anymore? My mother must have worn her heaviest heels. I'm beginning to wonder, if he'll leave dance in the floor as she stomps across it. Yes, anymore. Look, I'm not perfect, okay? His hands move over his short hair, and I freeze. The gesture is so familiar, it's uncanny. Not perfect. Ha. She laughs, her white teeth shining through the dim room. I want to turn a light on, but can't bring myself to move. I don't know how to feel or what to think as I watch my parents scream at each other in the middle of the living room. I'm convinced this apartment is cursed, it has to be. Not perfect is fine, doing drugs and dragging your daughter down the same path is deplorable. I'm not dragging her down any path. I'm trying my hardest to make up for what I did to her and to you. No. You're not. Your coming back around will only confuse her more. She's already messed her life up enough. She hasn't messed up her life, Hardin interrupts. My mother shoots him a fiery glare, before turning her attention back to my father. This is your fault, Richard Young. All of this. If it weren't for you, Teresa wouldn't be in this toxic relationship with this boy. She waves her hand toward Hardin. I knew it would only be a matter of time, before she started in on him. She never had a male example to show her, how women should be treated. That's why she's shacked up here with him. Unmarried, living in sin, and Lord only knows what he's doing. He's probably taking the drugs with you. I recoil, my blood instantly boils, and the raging need to defend Hardin surfaces. Don't you dare bring Hardin into this. He's been taking care of my father and providing him with somewhere to live to keep him off of the streets. I hate the way my choice of words resembles my mother's. Hardin crosses the room and stands beside me. I know he's going to warn me to stay out of it. It's true, Carol. He's a good man, and he loves her more than I've ever seen a man love a woman, my father chimes in. My mother's fists fall at her sides, and her perfectly blushed cheeks flare a deep red. Don't you dare defend him. All of this, she waves one clenched fist through the thick air, is because of him. She should be in Seattle, creating a life for herself. Finding herself a suitable man I can barely hear anything over the blood rushing and pumping through my head. In the midst of all of this, I feel terrible for Landon, who has kindly retreated to the bedroom to leave us alone, and for Hardin, who is, yet again, being used as my mother's scapegoat. She's living in Seattle, she's here visiting her father. I told you that on the phone. Hardin's voice breaks through the chaos, it's barely controlled, and it sends a shiver over my body raising the small hairs on my arms. Don't think that just because you called me we're suddenly friends, she snaps. Hardin jerks me back by my arm, and I glare up at him, puzzled. I hadn't even realized that I started toward her until he stopped me. Judgmental as always. You'll never change, you're still the same woman you were all those years ago. 
My father shakes his head in disapproval. I'm thankful that he's on Hardin's side. Judgmental? Are you aware that this boy, the one you're defending, weaseled his way between your daughter's legs to win money in a bet he made with his friends? My mother's voice is cold, smug, even. All of the air leaves the room, and I'm choking, gasping for a simple breath. That's right. He was bragging around campus about his conquest. So don't you defend him to me, she hisses. My father's eyes are wide. I can see the stormy currents gathering behind him as he looks at Hardin. What? Is this true? My father is choking for breath too. It's not important. We've already passed it, I tell him. See, she went and found herself someone exactly like you. Let us pray that he doesn't get her pregnant and leave when times get tough. I can't listen anymore. I can't let Hardin be dragged through the mud by both of my parents. This is a disaster. And not to mention just three weekends ago, a man dropped her at my house unconscious because of his, she points to Hardin, friends. They nearly had their way with her. The reminder of that night pains me, but it's the way my mother is blaming Hardin that bothers me the most. What happened that night was in no way his fault, and she knows it. You son of a bitch, my father says through his teeth. Don't, Hardin calmly warns him. I pray that he listens. You had me fooled. Here I was thinking you just had a bad rep, some tattoos, and an attitude. I could deal with that. I'm the same way. But you used my daughter. My father dashes toward Hardin, and I stand in front of him. My brain hasn't had a chance to catch up with my mouth. Stop it. Both of you. I scream. If you want to go to war over your past, that's your choice, but you won't bring Hardin into it. He called you for a reason, mother, and yet here you are throwing him under the bus out of anger. This is his place, not either of yours. Both of you can get the hell out. My eyes burn, as if they're begging me to shed the warm tears, but I refuse. My mother and father both halt, they look at me, then at each other. Sort your crap out or leave, we'll be in the bedroom. I wrap my fingers around Hardin's, and I try to pull him behind me. He hesitates for a moment before using his long legs to step in front of me and lead me down the hallway, still grasping my hand. His grip is tight, nearly unbearably so, but I stay quiet. I'm still in shock from my mother's arrival and blow up. Too much pressure on my hand is the least of my concerns. I push the door closed behind me just in time to muffle the shouting voices of my parents down the hall. Suddenly I'm nine again, running through the backyard of my mother's house to my haven, the small greenhouse. I could always hear the shouting, no matter how loud Noah attempted to be in order to mute the unpleasant noise. I wish you hadn't called her. I break from my memories and look up at Hardin. Landon is sitting at the desk, making a point not to stare at us. You needed her. You were in denial. His voice is gravelly. She made things worse. She told him about what you did. It made sense at the time to call her. I was trying to help you. The look in his eyes tells me he really thought it might work. I know, I say with a sigh. I wish he'd run the idea past me first, but I know he was doing what he thought was right. Damned if I do, damned if I don't. He shakes his head and plops down on the bed. Looking up at me with real anguish, he says, we'll always be reminded of that shit, you know that, don't you? He's shutting down. I can feel it just as surely as I can see it happening in front of me. No, that's not true. There's at least some truth to my words in that once everyone we know finds out about the bed, it'll become old news to them all. I shudder at the thought of Kimberly and Christian finding out, but everyone else around us now knows the humiliating truth. Yes, it is. You know it is. Hardin raises his voice and paces across the floor. It's never going to go away. Every time we fucking turn around, someone is throwing it in your face, reminding you of what a fuck up I am. His fist collides with the top of the desk before I can stop him. The wood splinters and Landon jumps to his feet. Don't do this. Don't let her get to you, please. I grab a fistful of his black sweatshirt, stopping him from beginning another assault on the already broken wood. He jerks away, but I don't let up. I grab both sleeves this time, and he turns around, fuming. Aren't you tired of this shit? Aren't you tired of the constant fight? 
If you would just let me go, your life would be much easier. Hardin's words come out clipped and loud, and each syllable cuts deep. He always does this. He always goes for self-destruction. I won't allow it this time. Stop that. You know that I don't want easy and loveless. I gather his face between my hands and force him to look at me. Both of you, listen to me, Landon interrupts. Hardin doesn't look at him. He keeps his furious gaze on me. My best friend, Hardin's stepbrother, walks across the room to stand only feet away from us. You guys can't do this again. Hardin, you can't let people get into your head like that. Tess's is the only opinion that matters. Let hers be the only voice in your head, he tells us. It's as if the black rings around Hardin's eyes visibly shrink as he takes in the words. And Tess Landon sighs. You don't need to feel guilty and try to convince Hardin that you want to be with him. You staying around through everything should be proof enough. Landon has a point, but I'm not sure if Hardin will see it through his anger and pain. Tessa needs you to comfort her right now. Her parents are screaming at each other in there, so be here for her, don't make this about you, Landon tells his stepbrother. Something in his words seems to click in Hardin's mind, and he nods, tilting his head down to press his forehead against mine, his harsh breathing slowing with each breath. I'm sorry he whispers. I'm going to go home now. Landon looks away from us, seemingly uncomfortable with witnessing the intimacy between Hardin and me. I'll let my mom know you'll be by. I move away from Hardin to wrap my arms around Landon's neck. Thank you for everything. I'm so glad you were here, I say into his chest. His arms tightly hug me, and this time Hardin doesn't pull me away. When I step out of the embrace, Landon leaves the room, and I look back at Hardin. He's examining his bloody knuckles, a sight that was beginning to turn into a distant memory. Now I'm seeing it again as the thick blood drips onto the floor. About what Landon said, Hardin says, wiping his bloodied hand on the bottom of his sweatshirt. When he said yours should be the only voice in my head. I want that. When he looks up at me again, his expression is haunted. I want that so fucking bad. I can't seem to shake them Steph, said, now your mum and dad. We'll figure it out, we will, I promise him. Teresa. My mother's voice resounds from outside the door. I had been too wrapped up and hardened to notice that the noise in the living room had dissipated. Teresa, I'm coming in. The door opens on the last word, and I stand behind Hardin. This seems to be a pattern. We need to talk about this, all of this. She eyes Hardin and me with equal intensity. Hardin's head turns, and he looks down at me, raising an eyebrow for approval. I don't think there's much to discuss, I say from behind my shield. There's plenty to discuss. I'm sorry for my behavior tonight. I lost my mind when I saw your father here after all these years. Please give me a little time to explain. Please. The word please sounds foreign coming from my mother's lips. Hardin steps away, exposing me to her. I'm going to go clean this up. He lifts his battered hand in the air and exits the room before I can stop him. Sit down, we have a lot to discuss. My mother runs her palms down the front of her dress and pushes her thick blonde waves to one side before she sits down on the edge of the bed. Chapter 123. Harden. The cold water blasts from the faucet onto my torn flesh. I stare down at the sink, watching as the red stained water swirls around the metal drain. Again? This shit happened again? Of course it did. It was only a matter of time. I leave the bathroom door open so I can easily access the room across the hall if I hear any screaming. I have no fucking idea what I was thinking when I called that bitch. I shouldn't call her that, but she is one, so bitch it is. At least I'm not saying it in front of Tessa. When I called her, I could only think of Tessa's blank expression and naive remarks, saying things like he's not doing drugs as she tried to convince herself of what was obviously not true. I knew she'd come undone at any moment, and for some stupid fucking reason I thought her mum being here could possibly be of help. This is precisely why I don't try to help people. I have no experience in it. I'm pretty damn excellent at fucking shit up, but I'm no savior. A flash of movement in the mirror catches my eye, and I look up to see Richard's reflection staring back at me. 
He's leaning against a narrow doorframe, his expression wary. What? Did you come to try and shank me or something? I say flatly. He sighs and runs his hands over his clean-shaven face. No, not this time. I scoff, half wishing that he would try and come at me. I'm certainly wound up enough for a brawl, or two. Why didn't either of you tell me? Richard asks, obviously referring to the bet. Is he fucking serious? Why would I tell you? And you sure as hell aren't stupid enough to believe Tessa would tell her father, her absentee father, some shit like that. I turn the faucet off and grab a towel to apply pressure to my knuckles. They've stopped bleeding, for the most part. I should learn to switch hands, punch with my right from now on. I don't know I feel blindsided, I thought you two were just opposites attracting, but now I'm not asking for your approval. Nor do I need it. I walk past him and hurry down the hallway. I go and grab a bag of burned popcorn that still rests on the floor. Let hers be the only voice in your head. Landon's words echo through my mind. I wish it were that easy, and maybe it will be one day I sure as hell hope so. I know you don't. I just want to understand all this shit. As her dad, I feel obligated to beat your ass. He shakes his head. Right, I say, wanting to remind him again that he hasn't been her father for over nine years. Carol was a lot like Tessa when she was young, he says, following me into the kitchen. I recoil, and the bag nearly slips from my fingers. No, she wasn't. There is no way in hell that this could be true. Honestly, I used to think Tessa was just like that prudish, bitchy woman, but now that I actually know her, I'm sure that it couldn't be further from the truth. Her struggle to appear perfect is certainly the result of having the woman as her mother, but otherwise Tessa is nothing like her. It's true. She wasn't quite as nice, but she wasn't always he trails off, grabbing a bottled water from my fridge. A bitch. I finish his sentence for him. His eyes dart down the empty hallway, as if he's afraid she's going to appear and toss him around again. I'd like to see that happen, actually she was always smiling her smile was something else. All the men wanted her, but she was mine. He grins at the memory. I didn't sign up for this shit I'm no fucking counselor. Tessa's mum is hot as hell, but she's got a constant stick up her ass that someone needs to remove, or maybe the complete opposite okay I don't get the point here. She had so much ambition and compassion then. It's really fucked up, because Tessa's grandma was just like Carol, if not worse. He laughs at the thought, but I cringe. Her parents hated, I mean hated me. They never hit it either. They wanted her to marry a stockbroker, a lawyer, anyone except me. I hated them too. May they rest in peace. He looks up at the ceiling. As fucked up as it is to say, I'm grateful that Tessa's grandparents aren't around to judge me. Well, obviously you two shouldn't have been married, then. I close the lid on the trash can, where I've just dropped the bag of popcorn, and lean my elbows on the counter. I'm frustrated with Richard and his stupid fucking habits which are upsetting to Tessa. I want to kick his ass out and send him right back onto the streets, but he's almost become like a piece of furniture in this apartment. He's like an old couch that smells like shit and always creaks when you sit down on it and it's uncomfortable as shit, but for some reason you can't throw it away. That's Richard. His face falls and he says softly, we weren't married. I tilt my head slightly out of confusion. What? I know Tessa told me that they were Tessa doesn't know. No one does. We were never married legally. We had a wedding to please her parents, but we never filed the paperwork. I didn't want it. Why? But maybe a more important question is, why am I so interested in this shit? Minutes ago I was imagining slamming Richard's head through the drywall. Now I'm participating in gossip like a fucking teenage girl. I should be listening at the door of my bedroom making sure Tessa's mom isn't filling her head with bullshit to try to take her away from me. Because marriage wasn't for me, he scratches his head, or so I thought. We did everything as a married couple. She took my last name. I'm not quite sure how she pulled that off. I think it was like she thought that by doing it, I'd finally consent or something, but no one knew the sacrifices she made for my selfishness. I wonder how Tessa would feel about this information she's so obsessed with the idea of marriage. 
Would this diminish her obsession or fuel it? Over the years, she grew tired of my behavior. We fought like cats and dogs, and let me tell you, that woman was relentless, but I took it from her. Once she stopped fighting me, that's when I knew it was over. I watched the fire slowly die out in her over the years. Looking at his eyes, I can see he's removed himself from this room and launched himself into the past. Every single night she would be waiting at the dinner table, her and Tessie both in dresses and hairpins, only for me to stumble in and complain about the burned edges of lasagna. Half the time I'd pass out before the fork hit my mouth, and every night ended with a fight I can't remember the half of it. A visible shudder passes over him. A vision of a very young Tessa, all dressed up at the table, waiting excitedly to see her father after a long day, only to have him crush her, makes me want to reach out and strangle the man. I don't want to hear another word, I warn him, meaning it. I'll stop now. I can see the embarrassment plastered on his face. I just wanted you to know that Carol wasn't always like this. I did it to her. I made her the bitter angry woman she is today. You don't want history to repeat itself, do you? Chapter 124. Tessa. My mother and I sit in silence. My mind is reeling, and my heart is pounding as I watch her tuck a lock of thick blonde hair behind her ear. She's calm and collected, not overwhelmed the way I am. Why would you let your father come here? After all this time. I can understand you wanting to see him more, after running into him on the street, but not allowing him to move in, she finally says. I didn't allow him to move in. I don't live here anymore. Harden let him stay out of kindness, kindness that you misinterpreted and threw in his face. I don't hide my disgust about the way she treated him. My mother, everyone, will always misunderstand Hardin and why I love him. It doesn't matter, though, because I don't need them to. He called you because he thought you would be there for me. I sigh, mentally deciding which way I want to steer the conversation before she bulldozes me into acquiescence in her typical Carol Young fashion. My mother's blue eyes are somber, cast to the ground. Why do you turn against everyone to defend that boy after all he has done to you? He's put you through so much, Teresa. He's worth the defending, mother. That's why. But, he is. I won't keep having this discussion with you. I told you before, if you can't accept him, then I can't have a relationship with you. Hardin and I are a package deal, whether you like it or not. I once thought that about your father. I do my best not to flinch when she lifts her hand to smooth the front of my hair. Hardin is nothing like my father. A light laugh sounds from her painted lips. Yes, oh yes, he is. He is like him in so many ways. You can leave if you're going to say those things. Calm down. She repeats the smoothing action on my hair. I'm torn between being irritated by the patronizing gesture and being comforted by the decent memories it brings. I want to tell you a story. I'll admit I'm intrigued by her words, though I'm skeptical of her motives. She never told me stories about my father while I was growing up, so this ought to be interesting. Nothing you say will change my mind about Hardin, I tell her. The corners of her mouth turn up slightly as she declares, your father and I never married. What? I sit up straight on the bed, crossing my legs beneath me. What does she mean, they never married? Yes, they did, I've seen the pictures. My mother's lace gown was exquisite, despite the fact that her belly was slightly swollen, and my father's suit wasn't tailored properly, it hung off him like a potato sack. I used to love to look through those albums and admire the way my mother's cheeks glowed as my father looked down at her, as if she were the only person in his world. I remember the awful scene that ensued one day, when my mother found me looking through them. After that, she hid them away, and I never saw them again. It's true. She sighs. I can tell that this disclosure is humiliating for her. Her hands are shaking when she says, we had a wedding, but your father never wanted to be married. I knew that, I knew that, if I hadn't gotten pregnant with you, he'd have left me much sooner. Your grandparents pushed the marriage on him. You see, your father and I could never get along, not even for a day. It was exciting in the beginning, thrilling even, the blue of her eyes is lost in the memory, but as you will come to see, there's only so much that one person can take. 
As the nights came and went, and the years passed, I prayed to God every night that he would change for me, for you. I prayed that one night, he'd walk through that front door with a bouquet of roses in his hand instead of liquor on his breath. She leans back and crosses her arms in front of her chest. Bracelets that she can't afford hang from her wrists, a tribute to her excessive need to look stylish. My mother's confession has left me silent. She's never been one for open discussion, especially when the topic is my father. The sympathy that I suddenly find myself feeling for this cold woman brings me to tears. Stop that, she scolds me before continuing, every woman hopes to be the one to reform her man, but that's all it is, false hope. I don't want you going down the same path that I did. I want more for you. I feel nauseous. That is why I raised you to be able to get out of that small town and make a life for yourself. I'm not, I begin to defend myself, but she raises her hand to silence me. We had our good days too, Teresa. Your father was funny and charming, she smiles, and he was trying his best to be what I needed him to be, but his true self overpowered that, and he became frustrated with me and with the life we shared for all those years. He turned to liquor, and it was never the same. I know you remember. Her voice is haunted, and I can hear the vulnerability in her tone and see it shining in her eyes, but she recovers quickly. My mother has never been fond of weakness. I'm once again taken back to the screaming, the breaking of dishes, even the occasional these bruises on my arms are from gardening, and feel my stomach get tied up in knots. Can you honestly look me in the eyes and tell me that you have a future with this boy, she asks as the silence ticks on. I can't respond. I know the future that I want with Hardin. Whether he'll be willing to give it to me is the question. I wasn't always like this, Teresa. She gently dabs both index fingers under her eyes. I used to love life, I was always excited about the future and look at me now. You may think I'm a horrible person for wanting to protect you from my fate, but I'm only doing what's necessary to keep you from repeating my history. I don't want this for you, I struggle to picture a young Carol, happy and excited about each new day. I can count the times that I've heard the woman laugh in the last five years on one hand. It's not the same, mother. I force myself to say the words. Teresa, you cannot deny the similarities. There are some, yes, I admit, more to myself than to her, but I refuse to believe that history is repeating itself. Hardin has already changed so much. If you have to change him, why even bother? Her voice is calm now as she looks around the bedroom that once was mine. I haven't changed him, he's changed himself. He's still the same man. All the things that I love about him are there, only he has learned to handle things differently and has become a better version of himself. I saw his bloody hand, she points out. I shrug. He has a temper. A massive one, but I won't go along with her putting him down. She needs to understand that I'm on his side and that from now on, to get to him, she has to go through me. So did your father. I stand. Hardin would never purposely hurt me. He isn't perfect, mother, but neither are you. Neither am I. I'm amazed at my own confidence as I cross my arms and match her glare. It's more than his temper think of what he's done to you. He humiliated you. You had to find another campus. I don't have the energy to argue with her statement, mostly because it holds a lot of truth. I'd always wanted to move to Seattle, but my bad experience this first year at school gave me the extra push that I needed. He's covered in tattoos, though at least he removed those hideous piercings. Her face twists in disgust. You're not perfect either, mother, I repeat. The pearls around your neck hide your scars, just as Hardin's tattoos hide his. My mother's eyes quickly flick over to me, and I can clearly see the words repeating in her mind. It's finally happened. I finally made a breakthrough in dealing with her. I'm sorry for what my father did to you, I really am but Hardin isn't my father. I sit back down next to her and dare to place my hand over hers. Her skin is cold under my palm, but to my surprise, she doesn't pull away. And I'm not you, I add as gently as possible. You will be if you don't get as far away from him as you can. I remove my hand from hers and take a deep breath to stay calm. You don't have to approve of my relationship, but you have to respect it. 
If you can't, I say, struggling to stay confident, then you and I will never be able to have a relationship. She slowly shakes her head from side to side. I know she was expecting me to give in to her, to agree that Hardin and I could never work. She was wrong. You cannot give me that type of ultimatum. Yes, I can. I need as much support as possible, and I am beyond exhausted with battling against the world. If you feel as if you're battling alone, perhaps it's time to change sides. She raises an accusatory brow at me. I stand again. I'm not battling alone, stop doing that. Stop it, I hiss. I'm trying my best to be patient with her, but my resolve is wearing as thin, as this night is long. I'm never going to like him, my mother says, and I know she means every word. You don't have to like him, but you won't be spreading our business to anyone else, including my father. That was incredibly wrong of you to tell him about the bet, and not in the least justified. Your father had the right to know what he has caused. She doesn't get it. She still doesn't understand. My head is going to explode any moment. I can feel the pressure building in my neck. Hardin is trying his hardest for me, but until now he's never known any better, I tell her. She doesn't say a word. She doesn't even look at me. That's it, then. You're going to take the second option? I ask. She stares at me, silent, the wheels of her mind turning and turning behind her heavily shaded eyes. She has no color left in her cheeks, despite the rosy blush she clearly swept across her cheekbones before she arrived. At last she mutters, I'll try to respect your relationship. I will try. Thank you, I say, but really I don't know what to make of this truce with my mother. I'm not naive enough to believe what she's promised until she proves it, but it still feels pretty good to have one of the heavy stones lifted from my back. What will you do about your father? We both stand. She towers over me in her four-inch heels. I don't know. I've been too distracted by the topic of Hardin to focus on my father. You should make him leave. He has no business being here clouding your mind and filling it with lies. He's done no such thing, I fire back. Every time I believe we've made any type of progress, she uses her sharp heel to kick me back down. He has. He has strangers showing up here, shaking him down for money. Hardin told me all of it. Why would he do that? I understand his concern, but my mother hasn't helped the situation one bit. I'm not going to kick him out. This isn't my place, and he has nowhere else to go. My mother's eyes close, and she shakes her head at me for the tenth time in the last twenty minutes. You have to stop trying to fix people, Teresa. You will spend your entire life doing it, but then you'll have nothing left of yourself, even if you succeed in changing them. Tessa? Hardin's voice calls from outside the bedroom. He opens the door before I respond, and his eyes immediately scan my face for signs of distress. You okay? He asks, ignoring my mother's presence completely. Yeah. I gravitate toward him, but avoid throwing my arms around him, for my mother's sake. The poor woman has already been dragged through 20 years of memories. I was just leaving. My mother runs her palms down her dress, stopping at the hem, and then repeating the action, a frown settling on her face. Good, Hardin rudely remarks, quick to protect me. I look up at him, my eyes pleading with him for silence. He rolls his eyes, but doesn't say another word as my mother strides by us and marches down the hall. The obnoxious clicking of her heels sends me into a full migraine. I take his hand and follow in silence. My father attempts to speak to my mother, but she brushes him off. You didn't wear a coat, he unexpectedly asks her. Just as puzzled as I am, she mumbles no and turns to me. I'll call you tomorrow answer this time? It's a question instead of a demand, which is some sort of progress. Yes. I nod. She doesn't say goodbye. I knew she wouldn't. That woman drives me flipping crazy, my father shouts when the door closes, his hands flying into the air in exasperation. We're going to bed. If anyone else knocks at the damn door, don't answer it, Harding grumbles and leads me back to the bedroom. I'm beyond exhausted. I can barely stand on my feet. What did she say? Hardin lifts his sweatshirt over his head and tosses it at me. I detect a flicker of uncertainty as he waits for me to collect it from the floor. 
Despite the greasy butter and blood smeared on the black fabric, I gladly remove my own shirt, along with my bra, and pull it over my head. I breathe in the familiar scent of him, which aids in calming my nerves. More than she said in my entire life, I admit. My mind is still reeling. Did any of it change your mind? He looks at me, panic and fear filling his eyes. I get the feeling my father must have had a similar talk with him, and wonder if my father holds the same grudge against my mother as she holds against him, or if he admits that he's to blame for the turmoil in both of their lives. No. I pull my loose pants down my legs and place them on the chair. You're sure? Aren't you worried that we're repeating there? Hardin begins. No, we are not. We're nothing like them. I stop him. I don't want anyone else getting into his head, not tonight. Hardin doesn't look convinced, but I force myself not to focus on that right now. What do you want me to do about your dad? Kick him out, he asks. He moves to sit on the bed with his back against the headboard while I grab his dirty jeans and socks from the floor. Hardin's arms lift to rest behind his head, fully displaying his toned ink body. No, don't kick him out. Please. I crawl into bed, and he pulls me onto his lap. I won't, he assures me. Not tonight, at least. I look up for a smile, but there isn't one. I'm so confused, I groan into his chest. I can help with that. He lifts his pelvis, an L apostrophe M forced forward, using my palms to steady myself against his exposed chest. I roll my eyes. Of course you can. Every problem looks like a nail, when your first tool of choice is a hammer. He smiles wickedly. Are you saying you need to get nailed? Before I can bemoan his bad joke, he takes my chin between his long, busted fingers, and I find myself shifting my hips, rubbing against him. I'm vaguely aware of my period. I know Hardin certainly doesn't mind it. You need sleep, baby. It would be wrong to fuck you right now, he says softly. I shamelessly pout. No, it wouldn't, I say and slide my palms down his stomach. Oh no, you don't. He stops me. I need a distraction, and Hardin is the perfect fix. You started it, I whine. I sound desperate, because I am. I know, and I'm sorry for that. I'll take you in the car tomorrow. His fingers slip under the sweatshirt and begin to draw unknown shapes across my bare back. And if you're a good girl, I'll even bend you over the desk of my father's house, just the way you like, he says into my ear. My breathing hitches, and I playfully swat at him, and he laughs. His laugh is almost as distracting as sex would be. Almost. Besides, we don't want to make a mess in here tonight, do we? Would your father out there? He'll probably see the blood on the sheets and assume I've killed you. He bites the inside of his cheek. Do not start that, I warn him. His cheesy menstrual jokes are not welcome right now. Ah, baby, don't be like that. He pinches my behind, and I yelp, sliding further into his lap, go with the flow. He grins. You've used that one before. I smile back. Well, excuse me for not being original. I like to recycle my jokes about once a month. I groan and try to roll off him, but he stops me and nuzzles my neck. You're disgusting, I say. Yeah, I'm just an old bloody rag, I suppose. He laughs and presses his lips to mine. I roll my eyes. Speaking of bloody rags, let me see your hand. I reach behind my back and gently grab him by the wrist. His middle finger is the worst, a thick gash spreads from knuckle to knuckle. You should get this looked at, if it doesn't begin to heal tomorrow. I'm fine. This one too. I run the pad of my index finger over the mangled skin on his ring finger. Stop fussing, woman, go to sleep, he grumbles. I nod in agreement and drift off to the sound of him complaining about my father eating his frosted flakes again. Chapter 125. Tessa. I lay in bed for over two hours, waiting patiently for Hardin to wake up before I gave up. By the time I've showered and am fully dressed, the kitchen is cleaned and I've taken two ibuprofen to get rid of my cramps and massive headache. I make my way back to the bedroom to wake him up myself. I gently shake his arm and whisper his name. It doesn't work. Hardin, wake up. I roughly grip his shoulder and recoil, 
when the vision of my mother ripping my father's slumbering body off of the couch flashes into my mind. All morning I've been avoiding thoughts of my mother and the heartbreaking history lesson I was given last night. My father is still asleep, I imagine that a short visit has worn him out as well. No, he grumbles sleepily. If you won't get up, then I'll be going to your father's house alone, I say, slipping my feet into my flat shoes. I have many pairs of toms, but I always find myself wearing the tan crocheted ones the most. Harding calls them hideous moccasins, but I love the comfortable shoes. He groans and rolls over onto his stomach, pushing himself up onto his elbows. His eyes are still closed when he turns his head to me. No, you won't. I knew he wouldn't like that idea, which is precisely why I used it to get his behind out of the bed. Get up, then. I've already showered and everything, I whine. I'm anxious to get to Landon's house and see him, Ken, and Karen again. It feels like ages since I last saw that sweet woman in the strawberry print apron that she hardly ever removes. Damn it. Hardin pouts, opening one eye. I stifle a giggle at the lazy expression covering his face. I'm tired too, mentally and physically drained, but the idea of getting out of this apartment for the day has perked me up tremendously. Come here first. He opens the other eye and reaches out for me. The moment I'm beside him on the bed, he rolls his heavy body on top of mine, encasing me in his warmth. He purposely rubs his hardness against me, grinding his hips until he's perfectly nestled between my thighs, his morning erection pressing torturously into me. Morning. He's wide awake now, and I can't help but laugh. He leisurely drags his hips in a circle again, and this time I try to wiggle free. He joins me in laughter, but quickly silences me by covering my mouth with his. His tongue laps mine, gently caressing, hinting at an intention completely opposed to the sharp movements his hips are making. Are you plugged, he whispers, still kissing me. His hands have moved to my chest, and my heart is thumping rapidly, making his sleepy voice barely audible. I am. I nod, only mildly cringing at the hideous term I have become used to. He pulls away, his eyes slowly raking over my face and his tongue swiping along his bottom lip, wetting it. The sound of kitchen cabinets opening and closing carries down the hallway, followed by a large belch, and then the crash of pans on the floor. Hardin's eyes roll. Fucking lovely. He stares down at me. Well, I had planned on fucking you before we left, but now that Mr. Sunshine's awake he climbs off of me and stands up, taking the blanket with him. I'll be quick in the shower, he says with a scowl toward the door. Hardin returns less than five minutes later just as I'm tucking in the corners of the bedsheet. The only article of clothing he's wearing is a white towel wrapped around his waist. I force my eyes away from his gorgeous, ink body and up to his face, while he walks over to the dresser and pulls out a signature black t-shirt. Pulling it down over his head, he steps into a pair of boxers. Last night was a fucking disaster. His eyes are focused on his busted hand as he buttons his jeans. Yeah. I sigh, trying to avoid any further conversation that revolves around my parents. Let's go. He grabs his keys and phone from the dresser and shoves them into his pockets. He pushes his wet hair back off his forehead and opens the bedroom door. Well, he impatiently remarks when I don't jump up right away. What happened to the playful Hardin from only minutes ago? If his bad mood continues this way, then I suspect that today will be just as bad as yesterday. Without a word, I follow him through the door and down the hallway. The bathroom door is closed and the water is on. I don't want to wait for my father to get out of the shower, but I also don't want to leave without telling him where we're going and making sure he doesn't need anything. What does he do in this apartment while he's alone? Does he think about drugs all day? Does he have people over? I shake the second thought from my head. Hardin would find out if he brought bad friends around, and my father sure as heck wouldn't still be here if that were the case. Hardin stays quiet during the drive to Ken and Karen's place. The only assurance I have that today isn't going to be a total wash is his hand resting on my thigh while he focuses on the road. When we arrive, Hardin, as always, doesn't knock before walking inside. The sweet smell of maple syrup fills the house, 
and we follow the scent to the kitchen. Karen is standing next to the oven, a spatula is one hand, while she waves the other through the air in conversation. An unfamiliar young woman is seated at one of the island stools. Her long brown hair is the only thing I see until she turns the stool around when Karen's attention is directed toward us. Tessa, Hardin. Karen nearly shrieks with joy as he carefully places the spatula onto the counter and rushes over to wrap her arms around me. It's been so long, she exclaims, holding me at arm's length and then crushing me back to her body. Her warm welcome is exactly what I needed after last night. It's only been three weeks, Karen, Harding rudely remarks. Her smile dims a fraction and she tucks her hair behind her ear. I peer around her to take in all the baked goods around the kitchen. What are you making? I ask to distract her from her stepson's sour attitude. Maple cookies, maple cupcakes, maple squares, and maple muffins. Karen pulls me along gently, while Hardin cowers in the corner, a deep frown set on his face. Ignoring him, I look at the young woman again, unsure how to introduce myself. Oh. Karen takes notice. I'm sorry. I should have introduced you first thing. She gestures to the woman. This is Sophia. Her parents live just down the road. Sophia smiles and reaches to shake my hand. Nice to meet you, she says with a smile. She's beautiful, extremely beautiful. Her eyes are bright and her smile warm. She's older than me, but she can't be much more than 25. I'm Tessa, Landon's friend, I say. Harding coughs behind me obviously displeased at my choice of words. I assume Sophia knows Landon, and since Hardin and I are well, this morning it just seems easier to introduce myself this way. I haven't gotten to meet Landon yet, Sophia says. Her voice is soft and sweet, and I immediately like her. Oh. I assume she knew him, since her family lives down the road. Sophia has just graduated from the Culinary Institute of America in New York, Karen brags for her, and Sophia smiles. I don't blame her. If I just graduated from the best culinary school in the country, I'd let people brag for me too. I mean, if I wasn't already doing it myself. I'm visiting my family, and I ran into Karen down the road buying some syrup. She grins, eyeing the massive amount of maple-flavored goodies on display. Oh, and this is Hardin, I say to include my brooding man in the background. She smiles at him. Nice to meet you. He doesn't even look at the poor woman and just says, yeah. I in turn offer her a shrug and a sympathetic smile, then turn to Karen. Where's Landon? Her eyes flicker to Hardin, then to me, before she answers, he's upstairs he hasn't been feeling well, she says. My stomach turns, there's something going on with my best friend, I know it. I'm going upstairs. Hardin turns to leave. Wait, I'll go, I offer. If something is going on with Landon, the last thing he needs is Hardin taunting him. No. Hardin shakes his head. I'll go. Have some syrup cakes, or whatever, he grumbles and takes two stairs at a time, giving me no chance to argue. Karen and Sophia watch him go. Hardin is Ken's son, Karen says. Despite his poor attitude today, she still smiles proudly at the mention of his name. Sophia nods in understanding. He's lovely, she lies, and the three of us burst into laughter. Chapter 126. Hardin. Fortunately for both of us, Landon's not rubbing one out when I push his bedroom door open. Predictably, he's seated in the recliner against the wall with a textbook on his lap. What are you doing in here, he asks, his voice hoarse. You knew we were coming. I take the liberty of sitting on the edge of his bed. I meant in my room, he clarifies. I choose not to answer that, actually, I don't know why I'm in his room. I sure as hell didn't want to stay downstairs with three women obsessing over one another. You look like shit, I tell him. Thanks. He looks back down at the textbook. What's wrong with you? Why are you up here moping around? I look around his normally tidy room to find it sort of messy, clean by my standards, but not by his intestines. I'm not moping. If something's wrong, tell me. I'm really good at, like, caring, I say, hoping humor might help somehow. He slams the book shut and stares at me. Why would I tell you anything? So you can laugh at me? 
No. I wouldn't, I say. I probably would. I had actually been planning on him telling me some stupid shit about getting a bad grade, so I could take my frustrations out on him, but now that he's here, in front of me, looking all pitiful, making him miserable doesn't appeal to me as much as it did before. Just tell me, maybe I can help, I offer. I have no fucking idea why I just said that. We both know I'm shit at helping anyone. Look at what a fucking disaster last night turned out to be. Richard's words have been eating away at me all morning. Help me? Landon gapes, obviously wary of my offer. Oh, come on, don't make me beat it out of you. I lie back on his bed and examine the blades of the ceiling fan, willing it to be summer already, so I could enjoy the sensation of it cooling me down. I hear his light chuckle and the sound of the book being placed on the desk beside him. Dakota and I have ended things, he admits meekly. I sit up quickly. What? That was the last thing I imagined would come from his mouth. Yeah, we've been trying to make it work he frowns, his eyes glossing over. If he fucking cries, I'm out of here. Oh I say and look away. I think she's been wanting to end it for a while. I glance at him again, not wanting to put too much focus on. His sad features. He really is like a puppy, especially right now. I don't like puppies, though, except this one, maybe my sudden animosity toward the curly-haired girl is strong. Why do you think that? I ask. He shrugs. I don't know. She didn't come right out and say that she wanted to end it, it's just she's been so busy lately and she never returns my calls. It's like the closer it got to me coming to New York, the more distant she became. She's probably fucking someone else, I blurt out, and he flinches. No. She isn't like that, he says, defending her. I probably shouldn't have said that. Sorry. I shrug. She's not that type of girl at all, he tells me. Neither was Tessa, but I had her shaking and moaning my name, while she was still seeing Noah, though I keep that fact to myself for everyone's sake. Okay, I say agreeably. I've been dating her so long that I can't even remember what life was like before her. His voice is quiet and so full of sadness that it makes my chest tight. It's an odd feeling. I know what you mean, I say. Life before Tessa was nothing, only sloshed memories in darkness, and that's exactly what it would be like after her too. Yeah, but at least you won't have to find out what it would be like after. What makes you so sure? I ask, noting that I'm taking away from his breakup announcement, but I must know the answer. I can't imagine anything would tear you two apart nothing has so far. Landon says it like it's the most obvious answer in the world. Maybe it is to him. I wish it were that obvious to me. So what now? Are you still going to New York? You're supposed to be leaving in what two weeks? Yeah, and I don't know. I've worked so hard to get into Nayu and I've already enrolled in my summer classes and everything. It just seems like a waste not to go, but it seems pointless to go at the same time. His fingers rub circles over his temples. I don't know what to do. You shouldn't go, I say. It would be really awkward. It's a big city, we'll never run into each other. And besides, we'll still be friends. Sure, the whole friends thing. I can't help but roll my eyes. Why didn't you tell Tessa what was going on? I ask him. She's going to be heartbroken for him. Tess has, he begins. Tess A, I correct him. Has enough on her plate. I don't want her worrying for me. Do you want me to keep this from her, don't you? I point out. I can tell by his guilty expression that he does. Only for now, until she catches a break. She's too stressed lately and I'm afraid one of these days something will tip her over the edge. His concern for my girl is strong and slightly irritating, but I decide against my better judgment and keep my mouth closed. I groan. She'll kill me for this, you know that. But I don't want to tell her either. He's right, she has enough going on, and I'm to blame for 90% of it. There's more he begins. Of course there is. It's my mom, she but a light knock at the door silences him. Landon? Harden? Tessa's voice sounds through the wood. Come in, Landon calls, all the while looking at me with pleading eyes, to reaffirm my promise of keeping his breakup from Tessa. 
I know, I assure him as the door opens, and Tessa steps inside carrying a plate, and the thick smell of syrup with her. Karen wanted you two to try these. She rests the plate on the desk and looks at me, then quickly turns to Landon with a smile. Try the maple squares first. Sophia taught us how to properly ice them see the little flowers. Her small finger points to the clots of icing piled onto the brown crust. She taught us how to make those. She's so lovely. Who? Landon asks, his brow raised. Sophia. She just left to go back to her parents' house down the road. Your mother really went crazy getting tons of baking secrets from her. Tessa smiles and brings a square to her mouth. I knew she'd like that girl. I could tell instantly that the three of them would squeal over one another in the kitchen, it's why I had to bolt. Oh. Landon shrugs and reaches for a square. Tessa apprehensively holds the plate out to me, and I shake my head, declining. Her shoulders slump, but she doesn't say anything. I'll have a square, I mumble, wanting her frown to go away. I've been an asshole all morning. She perks up and hands me one. The so-called flowers on the top look like globs of yellow snot. You must have iced this one, I tease her, pulling her by the wrist to sit on my lap. That was a practice one. She defends herself with her defiant lift of the chin. I can tell she's confused by my sudden shift in mood. Actually, so am I sure, baby. I grin and she flicks a piece of the yellow icing onto my shirt. She pouts. I'm no chef, okay? I look at Landon, who has his mouth full of cupcake, while he stares at the ground. I dip my finger onto my shirt to remove the icing, and before Tessa can stop me, I wipe my finger across her nose, smearing the hideous yellow across it. Harden. She tries to wipe it off, but I gather her hands in mine, the pastries falling to the floor. Oh, come on, guys. Landon shakes his head at us. My room's already a mess. Ignoring him, I resume licking the icing from Tessa's scrunched up nose. I'll help you clean up. She laughs as my tongue runs along her cheek. You know, I miss the days when you wouldn't even hold her hand in front of me, Landon complains. He bends down to collect the broken squares and smashed cupcakes from his floor. I sure as hell don't miss those days, and I hope Tessa doesn't either. Did you like the maple squares, Harden? Karen asks while pulling a ham from the oven and sliding it onto a cutting board. They were okay. I shrug my shoulders and take a seat at the table. When Tessa shoots me a glare from the seat next to me, and I backtrack. They were good, I say, earning a smile from my girl. I finally begun to realize that the tiniest things make her smile. It's weird as hell, but it works, so I'm going with it. My father turns to me. How's your graduation packet coming along? He lifts his glass of water and takes a sip, looking much better than he did when I saw him in his office last week. Good, it's completed. I'm not going to walk, remember? I know he remembers, he's just hoping that I've changed my mind. What do you mean, you're not going to walk? Tessa interrupts, which causes Karen to look up and stop carving the ham. Fucking hell. I'm not walking in that graduation, I'm having my diploma mailed, I reply sternly. This isn't going to turn into a trample Harden and change his mind thing. Why not? Tessa asks, which makes my father look pleased. That asshole planned this. I know he did. I don't want to. I look at Landon for backup, but he's avoiding my gaze. So much for our bonding shit earlier. It's clear that he's back on Team Tessa. Don't push it right now, I'm not walking, and I won't be changing my mind, I say to her, loud enough that everyone will hear me so there won't be any mistaking the finality of my decision. We'll talk about it later, she threatens with flushed cheeks. Sure, Tess, sure. Karen comes over with a ham on a serving platter, looking pretty proud of her creation. I suppose she should. Admittedly it smells pretty good. I wonder if she found a way to use maple syrup on it too. Your mum said you've decided to go to England, my father. Says. He doesn't seem uncomfortable speaking on the topic in front of Karen. I suppose they've been together long enough that him talking about my mum isn't awkward. Yes. I give him a one-word answer and take a bite of ham to signal that I'm done with the table chat. You're going to, 
right, Tessa, he asks her. Yes, I have to finalize my passport, but I'm going. The smile on her face knocks my irritation down a notch. It will be an amazing experience for you. I knew you told me how much you love England. I hate to ruin it for you, though, but modern London isn't quite like the London in your novels. He grins at her, and she laughs. Thank you for the warning, I'm aware that Dickens' London fog was actually smog. Tessa fits in so well with my father and his new family, much better than I do. If it wasn't for her, I wouldn't be speaking to any of them. Have Hardin take you down to Chawton, it's less than two hours from Hampstead, where Trish lives, my father suggests. I had planned on taking her there anyway, thanks. That would be lovely. Tessa turns to me, her hand moves under the table, and she squeezes my thigh. I know she wants me to be a good sport throughout this dinner, but my father is making it difficult. I've heard a lot about Hampstead, she adds. It's changed a lot over the years. It's not the small, quiet village it was when I lived there. Real estate prices have skyrocketed, he tells her. Like she gives a fuck about the real estate in my hometown. There are plenty of places to see, how long will you be staying, he asks. Three days. Tessa answers for both of us. I don't plan on taking her anywhere except Chaunton. I thoroughly plan to keep her locked away, so her weekend won't be ruined by any of my ghosts. I was thinking my father presses a cloth napkin to his mouth. I called around to a few places this morning and I found a really nice facility for your father. Tessa's fork drops from her hand and clatters onto her plate. Landon, Karen, and my father are all staring at her, waiting for her to speak. What? I break the silence, so she doesn't have to. I found a really nice treatment facility. They offer a three-month program for recovering Tessa whimpers next to me. It's such a low sound that no one else hears it but it resonates throughout my entire body. How dare he bring this shit up to her in front of an audience at the dinner table. The best in Washington, but we could look elsewhere too, if you'd like. His voice is soft, and I don't hear a hint of judgment in it, but her cheeks are flushed in embarrassment, and I want to rip my father's fucking head clear off. This isn't the time to bring this shit up to her, I warn him. Tessa jerks slightly at my harsh tone. It's okay. Harden. Her eyes plead with mine. I'm just a little caught off guard, she politely says. No, Tessa, it's not okay. I turn to Ken. How do you even know that her father is a junkie anyway? Tessa flinches again. I could break all the plates in this house for his bringing this up. Landon and I talked about it last night, and we both thought that discussing a rehabilitation plan with Tessa would be a good idea. It's very hard for addicts to get clean on their own, he says. You would know, wouldn't you? The words are out before I can think them through. My words didn't have the intended effect on my father, who just brushes the statement off with a smooth pause. When I look over to his wife, sadness is clear in her eyes. Yes, as a recovering alcoholic, I would know, he replies. How much does it cost? I ask him. I make enough money to fully support myself, and Tessa, but rehab? That shit's expensive. I would cover it, my father calmly answers. Hell, no. I try to stand from the table, but Tessa's grip on my arm is strong. I sit back down. You aren't paying for it. Hardin, I'm more than willing to. Maybe the two of you should talk about this in the other room, Landon suggests. What he's really saying is, don't talk about it in front of Tessa. Her grip on my arm lets up and my father gets to his feet at the same time that I do. Tessa doesn't look up from her plate as we go into the living room. I'm sorry, I hear Landon say, just before I pin my father against the wall. I'm getting mad, enraged, I can feel the anger taking over. My father pushes me off with more force than I'd expect. Why couldn't you bring this up to me, before throwing it in her face at the fucking dinner table, in front of everyone? I shouted him squeezing my fists tied to my sides. I think Tessa should have some say in it, and I knew you'd refuse my offer to pay. His voice is calm unlike mine. I'm pissed the hell off and my blood is boiling. I'm reminded of the many times I stormed out of family dinners at the Scott residence. It might as well be a damn tradition. You're damn right, I refuse. 
You don't need to be throwing your fucking money around to us, we don't need it. That's not my intention here. I just want to help you in any way that I can. How's sending her fuck up of a father to rehab going to help me? I ask, even though I know the answer. He sighs. Because if he's well, then she's well. And she's the only way to help you. I know that, and so do you. I let out a deep breath, not even arguing back, because he's right this time. I just need a few minutes to calm down, to bring myself back to reason. Chapter 127. Tessa. I'm relieved when neither Hardin nor Ken come back into the dining room with a bloody nose or black eye. As Ken sits back down and places his napkin on his lap, he says, I apologize again for bringing that up at the table. I was completely out of line. It's okay, really. I really appreciate your offer. I force a smile. I do appreciate it, but it's too much to accept. We'll talk about it later, Hardin hums into my ear. I nod and Karen stands up to clear the table. I've barely touched my food. The mention of my father's problem stole away my appetite. Hardin pulls my chair closer to his. Eat some dessert, at least. But I'm cramping again. The ibuprofen has worn off, and my headache and cramps have returned with a vengeance. I'll try, I agree. Karen brings a tray stacked with mounds of her maple-flavored treats to the table, and I reach for a cupcake. Harding grabs for a square, eyeing the perfectly iced flowers on top. I did that one, I lie. He smiles at me, shaking his head. I wish we didn't have to leave, I say when he glances at the clock. I try not to think about the watch he gave away, to pay my father's debt to the drug dealer. Is rehab really the best thing for my father? Would he even accept the offer? You're the one who packed up and moved to Seattle, he grumbles. I meant here, tonight, I clarify, hoping he'll catch on. Oh no I'm not staying here. I want to, I say with a pat. Tessa, we're going home to my apartment, where your dad is. I frown. That's exactly why I don't want to go there. I need some time to think and breathe, and this house seems to be perfect for that, even with Ken's mention of rehab at the dinner table. It's always been a sort of sanctuary. I love this house, and being in that apartment has been torture since I arrived. Yesterday. Okay. I pick at the corner of my cupcake. Finally Hardin sighs in defeat. Fine, we'll stay. I knew I'd get my way. The remainder of our time at the table isn't as awkward as what came before. Landon is quiet, too quiet, and I fully intend to ask him what's wrong after I finish helping Karen clean up the kitchen. I've missed having you around here. Karen closes the dishwasher and turns to me, wiping her hands on a towel. I've missed being here so much. I lean back against the counter. I'm glad to hear it. You've become like a daughter to me. I want you to know that. Karen's bottom lip quivers, and her eyes shine under the bright lights of the kitchen. Are you all right? I ask her, moving to stand next to the woman whom I've come to care for so much. Yes. She smiles. I'm sorry, I've been so emotional lately. She shakes it off, and just like that, she's back to normal, presenting a reassuring smile. Are you ready for bed? Hardin joins us in the kitchen, grabbing another maple square on his way over to me. I knew he liked them more than he let on. Go on, I'm just a mess. Karen hugs me and places a loving kiss on my cheek before Hardin wraps his arm around me, practically forcing me out of the kitchen. I sigh as we make our way to the staircase. Something doesn't feel right. I'm worried about her, and Landon, I say. They're fine, I'm sure, Hardin says as he leads me upstairs and to the door of his room. Landon's bedroom door is closed, and there's no light leaking out from beneath it. He's sleeping. Stepping into Hardin's bedroom, I immediately feel like it welcomes me, from the bay window to the new desk and chair, replacements for the ones Hardin destroyed the last time he was here. I've been at the house since then, but I didn't pay much attention. Now that I'm here again, I want to take in every detail. What? Hardin's voice startles me from my own thoughts. I look around the room, remembering the first time I stayed here with him. I'm just reminiscing, that's all, I say, stepping out of my shoes. He grins. Reminiscing, huh? In an instant, 
His black shirt is pulled up and over his head and tossed to me, dragging me deeper into my memories. Care to share? His jeans are next. He pushes them down his legs quickly, tossing them to the floor in a messy heap. While I admire his ink torso in a leisurely fashion as he lifts his arms straight up, stretching his long body. I was thinking about the first time I stayed here with you. It also happened to be the first time Hardin ever slept here. What about it? Nothing specific. I shrug, undressing myself in front of his watchful gaze. I fold my jeans and shirt, before tugging his black t-shirt over my head. Bra off. Hardin raises a brow at me. His tone is stern, and his eyes are a deep green. I remove my bra and climb into the bed to lie next to him. Now, tell me what you were thinking about. He pulls me by the waist and rests his hand on my hip when I'm securely lying on my side, as close as possible to his body. His fingertips trace over the waistband of my lace panties, sending a chill down my spine that spreads through my entire body. I was just thinking about when Landon called me that night. I look up at him to gauge his expression. You were making a giant mess of the place. I frown at the clear memory of broken china cabinets and porcelain dishes smashed into hundreds of pieces and scattered across the floor. Yeah, I was, he softly replies. The hand that isn't being used to tray circles onto my bare skin reaches up and gathers a lock of my hair. He twirls the strand slowly, never breaking eye contact with me. I was frightened, I admit. Not of you, but of what you would say. He frowns. I confirmed your fear then, didn't I? Yeah, I guess you did, I reply. But you made up for your harsh words. He chuckles, finally taking his eyes from mine. Yeah, only to say more fucked up shit the next day. I know where he's going with this. I try to sit up, but his palm flattens on my hip and presses me down. He speaks before I can. I loved you even then. You did. He nods once, tightening his grip on my hip. Yeah, I did. How did you know? I quietly ask. Hardin has mentioned that this was the night he knew that he loved me, but he never elaborated. I'm hoping that he will now. I just did. And by the way, I know what you're doing. He smiles a bright smile. And what is that? I place my palm on his stomach, covering the center of the moth that's drawn there. You're being nosy. He wraps the section of my hair he's been playing with around his fist and tugs playfully. I thought I was the hair puller here. I giggle at my corny statement, and then he does too. You are. He removes his hand from my hair, only for a moment, so he can gather the entire mass of messy blonde waves. He tugs, pulling my head back, so I'm forced to look at him. It's been too long. He dips his head down, gently leading me to sit up straight and runs his nose along my exposed jaw and neckline. I've been hard since your little tease this morning, he whispers, pressing the evidence between my thighs. The heat of his breath on my skin is almost unbearable, I'm wriggling under his dirty words and intense stare. You're going to take care of that, yeah, he says more than asks. He pulls his fistful of my hair down and back up again, gently forcing me to nod my head. I want to correct him, and tell him that he, in fact, is the one who went about teasing me this morning, but I stay quiet. I like where this is going. Without a word, Hardin releases my hair and my hip and pulls himself up to his knees. His hands are cold as they push up the fabric of the t-shirt, exposing my bare stomach and chest. His fingers greedily reach for my breasts and his tongue pushes into my mouth. I'm instantly ignited. All the stress from the last 24 hours is banished and Hardin fills all of my senses. Sit up, against the headboard, he instructs after removing the shirt completely. I do as he says, lowering my body until my shoulders rest halfway up the enormous lake-colored headboard. Hardin's boxers are tugged down, and he lifts one knee at a time, to remove them from his body. A little lower, baby. I reposition myself, and he nods in approval. Then he scoots across the bed, on his knees, and positions himself in front of me. My tongue slides out of my mouth, eager to be on his skin. My jaw relaxes, and Hardin wraps his fist around his erection, and I watch in awe as he brings it to my lips, pumping slowly. I open my mouth further, and Hardin's thumb glides over my bottom lip, 
dipping into my mouth only fractionally before his finger is um, replaced. He pushes into my mouth slowly, savoring the sensation of every inch of him sliding over my tongue. Fuck, he groans from above me. I look up to see his eyes burning into me. One hand is grasping the top of the headboard to steady himself as he withdraws and pushes back in. More, he pants, and I wrap my hands around his rear, pulling him closer. My mouth coats him, and I take slow drags of him, enjoying this just as much as he does. He feels like silk across my tongue, and his rapid breathing and low calls of my name, telling me how good I am for him, how much he loves my mouth, make my entire body burn with need for him. He keeps moving, in and out, in and out. So fucking good. Look at me he begs. I blink up at his face again, taking in the way his brows have lowered, the way his bottom lip is pulled between his teeth, and the way his eyes are watching me. He hits the back of my throat repeatedly, and I notice the way the muscles along his stomach are expanding and tightening, signaling what is next. As if he can read my mind, he groans. Fuck, I'm going to come. His movements pick up, and he's being more forceful. Now. I squeeze my thighs to relieve some of the pressure and suck harder. I'm surprised when he withdraws from my mouth and comes across my bare chest. With another moan of my name, he leans forward in exhaustion, his forehead pressed against the headboard. I wait patiently for him to catch his breath and lower his body to sit next to me. His hand reaches over, and to my horror he slowly rubs his hand across the mess he made on my skin. He watches it, transfixed for a moment, before meeting my eyes. All mine. He grins cheekily, pressing a soft kiss to my open mouth. I, I stare down at my sticky chest. You like it. He smiles, and I don't deny it. It looks good on you. I can tell by the way his eyes are focused on the shining skin, that he really does think that. You're filthy is all I can think to say. Yeah. And so are you. He nods to my chest and grabs me by the hips to yank me off of the bed. I squeal, and he covers my mouth with one hand. SHH, we don't want an audience, while I'm fucking you over the desk, now, do we? Chapter 128. Harden. The smell of coffee fills my nostrils, and I reach for Tessa, knowing she's close by. When my search comes up empty, I open my eyes to find two cups of coffee resting on the dresser and Tessa packing her bag. What time is it? I ask her, hoping she says it's still early. Nearly noon, she says instead. Fuck, I've slept through half the damn day. I've already packed everything and had breakfast. Lunch will be ready soon, she tells me with a smile. She's already showered and gotten herself dressed. She's wearing those damn jeans again, the tight pair. I force myself out of bed and try to keep myself from lashing out at her for not waking me earlier. Cool, I respond and reach for my pants from the floor only they aren't on the floor anymore. Here. Tessa hands me the jeans, folded, of course. Are you okay? She must sense my hostility. I'm fine. Harden, she presses. I knew she fucking would. I'm okay. The weekend just went too fast, that's all. Her smile is enough to melt the ice that had formed around my mood. It really has, she agrees. I hate this living separate shit. I hate it so fucking much. We only have to get through until Thursday, she says, trying to make the distance seem less distant. What did Karen make for lunch? I change the subject. Nothing involving maple syrup, I hope. She laughs. No, no syrup. Landon is birding at the table when we walk into the dining room at the same time as Karen, who's carrying a tray of sandwiches. Tessa sits down next to Landon, and I watch as she asks him if he's all right. I'm okay, just feeling a little off, he says. I never thought I'd see the day he'd lie to her. Are you sure, because you've been acting so, Tessa he reaches up, and I swear, if he puts his hand on hers I'm fine. He smiles, lowering his hand from the table. I quickly reach for her hand in them on my lap, covered with my own. The boring table chat fades in and out. I don't participate, and all too soon it's time for me to drive Tessa back to Seattle. I'm once again reminded of what a fucking idiot I am for not moving there in the first place. I'll see you again before you leave, right? 
Tess's eyes water as Landon hugs her goodbye. I look away. Yeah, of course. Maybe I'll come up there to visit you once. You're back from your visit to the Queen, he quips, making her smile. I appreciate his effort, especially since I'm going to be the one she loses her shit on when she finds out that him and Dakota broke up, and I kept it from her. Ten minutes later, I'm practically dragging Tessa's ass out of the house. Karen is much more upset than you would expect any reasonable person to be, and she tells Tessa that she loves her, which is pretty fucking weird. Does it make me a horrible person that I feel more comfortable around your family than my own? Tessa asks me after 15 minutes of driving in silence. Yes. She glares at me, making me roll my eyes at her pretend anger. Both of our families are fucked up, I say, and she nods, returning to her silence. The closer my car gets to Seattle, the stronger the current of anxiety that's flowing through my chest. I don't want to spend the entire week away from her. Four days away from Tessa is a fucking lifetime. The moment I get back, I'm heading straight to the gym.